welcome to Senate Education. Uh, I'm Brian Campion. Uh, we are about to kick things off uh, today, Wednesday, the 13th of January. And so I thought I'd start by giving everybody uh, a little bit of a sense of, of the direction we're going in today and, and tomorrow and, and even Friday. Uh, I took a lot of your suggestions from yesterday during our brainstorming time and started to plug in some spots that we could hear from people connected to some of your ideas. Uh, hopefully it'll generate um, additional ideas of conversations and possibly bills. Today we're going to continue uh, talking and getting a sense from those on the ground, uh, as well as uh, um, those who are in contact with those on the ground regarding COVID, um, and also just continue continue our sort of tour of, uh, if you will, uh, education policy in the state of Vermont with uh, some of the, the key players. So today, uh, you know, as people will recall, yesterday we, we heard from Secretary uh, uh, French, we also heard from um, Dr. Levine, and we started talking to the Superintendent's Association, the Principals Association. Today, we're going to hear from the Vermont NEA. Uh, I've asked them to um, give a, spend some time introducing themselves, the kind of work they do, uh, how we might work and partner with them in the future, as well as talk about uh, what's on the ground, uh, what they're seeing, and what uh, teachers and staff and students need at this point from their perspective from this committee and perhaps from the Appropriations Committee, Health and Welfare, et cetera. Uh, I also asked them to give us a sense of what it's like to be a Vermont teacher. And uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned yesterday when we were reviewing you know, some of our priorities, something that's really interesting to me, I think others as well, what is it like to teach in Vermont? Uh, what is it, does it look like to become a teacher in Vermont? Um, what's that process? What is it like to retire as a teacher in Vermont? What is it like to be in the classroom? And of course, uh, these are just, these are some of their representatives. And I think we should also hear directly from teachers. And if people have anybody in their district that you think, um, and please know this is a general invitation. If there are people in your district who are on the ground or people that you think would contribute to any of these conversations that we're having, I think that would be, I mean, I would certainly welcome that. Um, after we hear from the NEA, we'll take, uh, I'm not sure if we're taking a break then, uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll take a couple of minutes and then at 2.30, we'll hear uh, from Joyce Judy, who's the president of the Community Colleges of Vermont. Yesterday I mentioned, you know, I just kind of threw it out there. As we're looking at remediation, uh, is it possible, should we be thinking about providing high school seniors with an additional, with a, uh, with a free year, if you will, of community college? Could that fit into some kind of package uh, as we're looking at, again, what students may have missed and not experienced during this past year? There's also the question of what does a senior year look like in Vermont generally uh, and, and how dynamic, how exciting is that? Or are there ways to, again, partner with CCV? So I've asked uh, President uh, Judy to come in, talk to us a little bit about her work, CCV's work. And, and maybe and just have a conversation with us, an early conversation about um, some of these possibilities. Uh, and then finally, oh, and I also should mention, I, I mentioned to Joyce Judy, what we've talked what we talked about yesterday, and I hopefully will become a, a, a common theme in here is what and how can we partner with the Biden administration when it when possible? Are there ways to partner? with them if there are things that the Biden administration is looking to do and if they match this state's interests and priorities, can we be an incubator? Can we be a pilot? And you know, I, I think uh, Joyce Judy has some thoughts on that. And then I've also invited in the new chancellor of the state colleges uh, and asked her to give us an overview of the state colleges, particularly also as it relates to COVID. Um, so with that, um, we can talk at the end of the meeting about what the, this, the end of this week looks like, as well as next week. But uh, unless I see anyone who has any questions or concerns, I will turn it over um, to the executive director of the NEA, Jeff Fannin. Does anybody have any uh, questions or concerns? Okay, great. Mr. Fannin, thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you, yeah. Senator Campion, and uh, welcome back to Senate Education. Um, Thank you. Glad to be here. And, and uh, good to see uh, Senator Perchlick back, but also welcome uh, 
Senator Terenzini, Senator Hooker, uh, and Senator Chittenden, um, and Senator Lyons. And I'm going around my screen here, my Hollywood squares. Um, so uh, yes, I, I'm Jeff Fan, the Executive Director of Vermont and EA. Thank you for having us here. I'll introduce uh, in a minute here Don Tinney, uh, the President of Vermont, and, uh, Vermont and EA, and Colin Robinson, our Political Director. Um, and those are the these are the faces you'll see uh, in the Zoom environment now uh, with you folks. And uh, if you have questions, we'll give you our contact information so you can reach out to us. And um, by all means, please do so. We're here um, to advocate with you and, and as, as you said, Senator Campion, to uh, partner with you to make sure that the public school system, the education system in Vermont works as well as it possibly can for the, the betterment of all students. I mean, that's truly, I think we all can, uh, may have disagreements along the way about how we get there, but I think we're all striving for the same goal. So Vermont EA wants all children, as they say, to have an excellent education. Uh, our purpose is to uh, make sure our members have a satisfying work environment where they are acknowledged for the work they perform, uh, where they and uh, <clears throat> where their work helps students do their best, and so uh, where the, the student's learning environment is also the educator's uh, work environment. So that's important that they go hand in hand. Um, just I'll give you a quick rundown of who Vermont and EA is, and then and, and then we'll get into some other details. Uh, we are an affiliate of the NEA. Uh, we've got some. Um, uh, you know, 13,000 members who are members of Vermont and EA. Uh, we um, represent not just teachers, but school support staff. So that means bus drivers, cafeteria workers, paraeducators, uh, and they're working with students um, in schools right now. Uh, most schools are open, frankly, and most educators are in the buildings right now. Um, and so they're, they're working hard at work uh, on behalf of their students. Um, the structure at Vermont is we've got a 20 uh, member board of directors. They're elected members, um, four statewide officers, Don being the president, um, and, and uh, about 20 staff members who um, almost entirely consist of former teachers. We have two lawyers on staff, a general counsel and a staff attorney, but they don't bargain. So contrary to what you hear sometimes, uh, we hire former teachers to work with our members to teach them how to bargain and sit down and have conversations with their school board members. So we've got uh, elementary school teachers, music teachers, science teachers. They're the field staff that go around and, and work with our members to educate them and work with them. That's our model, that's how we work. Uh, we have some 20, I think it is subject matter affiliates, uh, such as teachers of math, teachers of English, uh, special ed, art, uh, and those sorts of things. So we work with them as well. Um, we have about 100 or 110 or so local associations around the state. We're in every corner of the state. Uh, and we, ba our basic activity is we collectively bargain with our school boards over the terms and conditions of employment that include their salary, uh, their work hours, their bus duty, uh, prep time, all those sorts of things that go into teaching students and uh, educating students who, who's on recess duty, those sorts of things all, because they're important, end up in a contract with the, uh, between the school board and the local association so that the school can, everybody knows the rules of the road and they can operate uh, well. Uh, we do, we are probably the largest provider of professional development for educators that includes support staff as well as teachers. In the state, we are the largest provider. So, um, we are providing a lot of PD, as we call it, to our members around the state all the time. And uh, uh, we think we do that well, but um, that's one of our biggest jobs. And um, we do this, we do some public advocacy work. Um, and, and we are involved politically because uh, the state house is involved in the schoolhouse. Um, that means education funding, things of that nature, uh, learning issues that you deal with in, in house education, but also just generally uh, worker issues, worker rights issues that uh, sometimes are found in other committees. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll be here in, in and out your, of your committee talking about these host of pol public policy issues. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it over to Don to sort of get into uh, the moment we're in now, the moment of the day, the pandemic. So with that, I'll, I'll introduce Don Tinney, the president of Vermont NEA. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And if I do this correctly, it 
Is that correct? With so good afternoon. For the record, I am Don Tenney, a 31-year veteran English teacher from South Hero, uh, currently serving as president of Vermont NEA. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today, and, and thank you for serving on this most important committee. I am beyond proud to represent our extraordinary Vermont educators who have never stopped working to meet the needs of their students since the onset of the pandemic. Our members, <clears throat> our members put forth Herculean efforts in adapting to re remote learning last March to continue providing instruction and engaging their students. Our food service workers, paraeducators, and school bus drivers went above and beyond the call of duty to provide nutritious meals to students and their families. If COVID-19 has taught us one thing, it is how important schools are in providing a nutrition lifeline to the children and youth of Vermont. This is why our organization will continue to promote the implementation of universal school meals in every community because educators know that hungry children cannot learn. Feeding all of our children is an integral part of educating our children. This is just one true indicator of why the public school is the bedrock of every community. As essential workers on the front line, our educators have been going to work every day, providing direct instruction and support to students in their classrooms, as well as students learning virtually at home. The hybrid models, which I'm sure you have heard about, have allowed schools to maintain proper physical distancing and other safety protocols, but they have nearly doubled the workload of our teachers. Since they must plan and implement lessons for both the physical classroom and the virtual classroom. While students may not be learning every lesson in our traditional curriculum, they continue to learn on a daily basis and have had to acquire executive skills that they would not have ordinarily learned until later in life. Our support personnel, including custodial and staff, semesters, paraeducators, administrative assistants, and food service workers, continue to put themselves at risk on the front lines and service to their students. When we consider the health risks and the chronic unpredictability that our members have been enduring since last March, we can easily understand why they have been experiencing levels of stress and anxiety as never before. Our educators have always been focused on the social emotional well being of their students. And in these tumultuous days, we have been reminding them to focus on their own social emotional well being. From being in meetings with folks from the De Vermont Department of, Public of Mental Health, I know they share our concerns for the mental health of both our students and our education workforce. We must continue to work at banishing the stigma associated with mental health issues and make sure that the resources are available to provide counseling and other services to our students and our educators. In the spring of 2019, through a grant from the National Education Association, Vermont NEA convened a summit of nearly 200 education stakeholders to discuss trauma-sensitive practices and our approach to creating safe, compassionate schools. Our work has continued, and over this last summer, we hosted a webinar series with Dave Melnick of the Northeastern Family Institute, who discussed adverse childhood experiences, resiliency, and how we can shift our mindset about student behavior. We received additional funding from our national organization to work with our New England counterparts in a regional approach to this work, incorporating a train the trainer model and other ideas and how we can make this work sustainable over time and across all school districts. This is not work that can be accomplished by sending individual educators off to a workshop or holding one in-service training. In the virtual setting and in the classroom, we must continue to address the trauma our students and educators have experienced and pay particular attention to the minority trauma our BIPOC and marginalized students have experienced. We must continue to do everything we can to make sure every school is a sanctuary for every student. 
All of the additional protocols and programmatic adjustments demanded by the pandemic have dramatically changed the school day. And our educators, as do all Vermonters, long for the day when we can return to what we used to call a normal routine. We share the goal of our state leaders to return to full-time in-person learning, but only when it is safe for students and for the education workforce. While learning has continued throughout the pandemic, remote learning is not an effective substitute for in-person learning, where students experience daily interactions with their educators and peers. Since returning to full-time in-person instruction is a top priority, then protecting the health of the education workforce through vaccinations must also be a top priority. Since last March, our members have not only been busy planning their own lessons and rewriting their curriculum, but have also been involved with local committees and implementing the state's health and safety guidelines and other protocols related to the pandemic. Over 20 of our members joined our Vermont NEA statewide task force on the safe reopening of schools to address the issues related to our return to the classroom. Before the start of the school, the task force hosted virtual town halls with Dr. Mark Levine, Dr. Brina Holmes, Dr. William Raskin, Dr. Benjamin Lee, to disseminate up-to-date medical information to our members. They have also met with Secretary French to share their concerns and to hear his perspective on reopening. They continue to meet to address health and safety concerns and most recently hosted a webinar with industrial hygienists affiliated with the National Education Association to explore the issues related to ventilation in our school buildings. Air quality will continue to be an issue we need to address during the pandemic and beyond. And we appreciate the General Assembly's support of HVAC inspections and upgrades. As educators, we never thought we'd be learning so much about HVAC systems, epidemiology, physical distancing, and the difference between viral droplets and aerosols. But the learning curve has been steep and interesting. Learning is at the core of what we do. Our educators cherish the time they spend with their students and are the people in their young lives outside of their immediate family who know them best. They know how their students learn and through ongoing informal assessment, know, how, know what interventions and supports they need. Our educators will need additional resources to support their students as they address the unfinished learning from the pandemic. Vermont educators are up for that challenge, driven and sustained by their love and commitment for their students. Thank you. And, and I'll turn things over to Colin. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Great to see folks. And uh, welcome, Senator Campion, back to Senate Education. Um, I will keep this brief so you all can have opportunities to ask your questions. But I did want to, as we look ahead, um, you know, Vermont NEA has a comprehensive legislative agenda that we'll be sharing. Uh, in the next week or so that touches on a suite of issues from education funding to educational equity and quality issues. But one specific issue that I want to lift up as we look ahead to this pandemic moment and we look to recovery. There are models across the nation that uh, is it's a model called the community schools model. And it echoes a lot of the points that Don mentioned that Schools are at the heart of our communities. They are the bedrocks of our communities and they provide supports to students and families so they can be successful learners. And this model um, is a metric through which schools can provide greater support for students and families as we recover from the pandemic. So what this would look like on the ground is perhaps having additional resources for families to receive medical support inside a school setting or mental health support, or be able to receive connections with different state agencies for critical social and economic needs that they might have, um, or housing assistance. The idea is that our schools, as Don said, are the cornerstones of our community. And in that role, they provide a lot of needs, uh, needed support to students. But our schools aren't necessarily the best equipped to provide those supports. So this community schools model 
uh, would allow schools to develop partnerships with other organizations so they could be hubs for students and families to receive the supports they need so they students and their families can be successful citizens as well as successful learners and allow educators, teachers, and support staff to do the critical work as we emerge from this pandemic um, to be able to focus on learning. And so to that end, there is a, um, there's a bill uh, that Representative Kathleen James um, from down in Manchester is introducing on the House side that we're hoping might end up in this committee to create a pilot structure of 10 schools across the state to be able to hire a what's called a community schools coordinator, somebody to do a needs assessment, figure out what are the critical supports students and families need to be successful citizens and successful learners so that educators be um, ensured that they're able to focus on their learning of the students as we emerge and move through this pandemic over the next several years. And that community, that assessment would be the charge of the community schools coordinator who would then go out and figure out what state agencies can we partner with? What nonprofits can we partner with? What services can we make sure our students and our families are able to receive in a place where there's as little friction as possible so they can um, have those needs met? And so as we look ahead and try to address the immediate needs now, what are the long-term needs and what are some innovative models that we could implement in Vermont to ensure our communities thrive, our students thrive, and our schools and educators thrive as well. So with that, I will pause and thank you for having us today and, and allowing us to have this conversation with you at this critical moment. So thank you, Senator Campion. So you, you mentioned some stuff earlier, but I, I'm gonna pause here and, and uh, let, are there any questions for us at sort of this moment? And then maybe we can get into the stuff that you mentioned earlier that you want us to talk about. I guess if I, I might just start, um, when we're looking at things that, you know, uh, Senator Kitchen and I met last evening for a little while um, about CARES funding and this committee's role in, you know, kind of doing some assessment and sending some of these ideas to appropriations. You know, what are the things, I guess, right now that you're looking at that you, that our schools might need, um, either through funding, I'm curious about also your thoughts on reopening. So sort of immediate needs that you would tell this committee that you're, you're seeing. Okay, well, um, I'll give a stab and I know Don and Colin will, will correct me when I'm wrong. Um, so I, I think that the whole uh, disrupted learning is what we're calling it, right? Kids were learning up until the pandemic and then things have changed. So it disrupted their learning. Um, and I think it need, we need, schools need resources to uh, deal with the trauma that kids have suffered, right? That was a problem we, you know, as Don mentioned, we had a, a, a large meeting in, in 2019 over trauma mm -hmm. uh, in schools and it's, it's exacerbated now through the pandemic and we know that. Um, so when these kids, you know, are back, they're back now and yeah. when they come back more full time, uh, they may need more resources, frankly, and that, that means people. I mean, it, it really, kids need people. And I, there's no substitute, as Don said, for the human interaction between an educator and her students. There just is not. And so um, in the short term, perhaps some of the, I think it's $127 million in the last package going to education um, ought to be focused on making sure that, that schools have the resources uh, to educate their kids. Okay, know. but I mean, if, if just to push a little specifics, yeah. I mean, you know, does that mean moving toward certainly, you know, what does that mean exactly? It means bodies, humans, employees, working with kids, frankly. Okay, uh, so psychologists, and, mental health professionals, or- I'm sorry, yes, yeah. all of it. All of it, okay. Right. Literacy specialists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would be, would be uh, also critical there. I think we need to um, be planning uh, more resources offered during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've, we've seen some great success uh, with summer programs, uh, particularly in the transition years for, uh, for, the, for eighth graders before they get into high school. I think that our folks could 
you know, identify those students with the greatest needs and, and make arrangements for some summer programs. I don't necessarily think it, everything has to happen this summer, but I think we need to build that in uh, because we always have that gap in the summertime that we could make better um, use of for, for learning. That would be one indication. I will say one of, one of the um, pieces that people have learned and appreciated in the hybrid model, which has been incredibly challenging because of the workload. The, the bright side of that though, is because our educators have dealt with only about half their class each, each day, and then the, you know, as they alternate, the, the class size has had a huge impact and they have got to know their students uh, much more easily in the fall. Uh, behavior issues were in, for the most part non-existence because they didn't have as many students in the classroom. So I think when we talk about resources, one of the things we do need to look at is just what is the impact on class size, particularly for those students who are struggling, whether it be what we you know, traditionally call a remedial reading class or, or classes that are designed specifically for struggling students. Can we keep those classes small so that they're still effective? Great. Senator Lyons, you have your hand up and then Senator Hooker. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for all of this. I think what you have been talking about uh, resonates with what some of us heard at a Essex Westford school meeting last night. And um, Senator Chitton and I were there together so he can, he can help with this one as well. But one of the things that we heard was the shorthandedness uh, that people are feeling that staff reduction has been significant and as a result of COVID. And so, and as we go forward, hopefully that, that'll change and people will regroup. But in the interim, I, and I have two questions. I have a lot of questions, but, um, and I don't mean to comment so much up front, but just contextually, I think it's important um, the, uh, the issue of how best to provide those mental health or agent, uh, human services resources in schools has continued to be a debate. Um, it's, it's always about whose job is it? Uh, teachers, uh, of course, are, I'm always at Maine amazed <laughs> at what our teachers do and what they can do for the development of children and helping counsel them. But the question is, as you're looking at the resource needs and including mental health, healthcare, all the rest, how do you see that happening? So is the point person, the school nurse, is the point person, someone at AHS bringing in um, additional counseling staff is the point person, the teacher who has uh, faculty development to take them in a, a new direction. So I just, I, this, is, this has been an ongoing uh, question. What role does the teacher play and in uh, human service needs and what role might a school nurse play? You get, you get my drift here. So I'm just looking for your, your thoughts. So Senator, I, I'd be happy to speak to that as best I can and then might um, defer to Don. You, you're exactly right. I mean, this is not a new conversation. Of course, <laughs> your other committee, I know it's, it's come up many times and there's been a lot of conversation. Quite frankly, how some of these costs um, are now baked into the education fund, right? right. Um, in addition to the critical services. So I think, you know, as, as we look ahead, what would be most critical first and foremost is to figure out what's gonna work in each community. Cause I think we, we know that schools and school districts work differently in different parts of the state. Um, and so a one size fits all approach is not necessarily going to be appropriate um, because it might not meet the needs of, of place, places uh, in various and diverse corners of our state. Um, I do think fundamentally, 
Um, that's part of the reason why we're sort of interested in this pilot community schools model, because what it does is it creates this one individual, because one thing that we've learned and actually Senator Campion, um, uh, one of the schools down in Bennington, we visited last, um, last spring, or sorry, not last spring, last fall, um, a year ago fall, and it was sort of adopted as a community schools model at, uh, about 20 or so years ago. And what they realize is over the past 15 or so years, it's kind of not been doing exactly what they had originally hoped. And I remember asking, well, why is that? And they said, well, it used to be the principal that did this, but then other stuff came up, right? And there wasn't one person who was able to own that work to build that connection with the designated agency, to reach out to the Department of Mental Health to say like, hey, how can we get additional resources in here to build that relationship with the food shelf or the federally qualified health center um, to maximize those resources and supports for students and families. So I think having that, that one person um, that owns that work is really critical. I'm not sure that putting it on um, educators is necessarily the best just because they might not have the expertise. Um, and I think, uh, you know, quite frankly, I'm, I'm sure the Department of Mental Health and the Agency of Education are, uh, have, we all know, a tremendous amount on their plate right now as well. So um, I, I don't know that that fully answers your question, but I think that that's sort of what we're trying to drive at with this notion. It, it does. It does begin to answer the question, and I think ultimately, uh, because it does sound like a terrific uh, program, it does get down to how it's funded, and adding more into the education fund for me is. I, I think our constituents would roll their eyes. Having said that, then if you'd ask our designated agencies or AHS similarly, they would start to roll their eyes. So we're, this is gonna take a little heavy lift on the, on the resource part, but I, I guess the question I have is, it seems to me that this is so very much related to COVID and having some urgent response to the increased mental health needs that the uh, CRF should possibly be available to, you know, sort of jumpstart the pilot uh, programs that you're talking about. So I'll leave that to the chair of the committee to duke that one out with someone, or I can help. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be all hands on deck. Right. Uh, good question. Senator Lyons, did you have a follow-up to that? No, you know, I think that's good for now. I think there's a, we've got a, we've got a lot to go through. Okay. Uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I, I want to say that I don't know if it's just my internet, but I'm occasionally having kind of glitches and that just underscores the need for better broadband, that, which is an immediate thing that we have. Secondly, I want to um, commend Mr. Tenney for the webinar last night on pensions. I think that's another thing that we need to talk about as far as education is concerned. And um, thirdly, uh, <laughs> Mr. Tinney, you mentioned last night that there's a possibility of a bill that would uh, facilitate bringing perhaps retired teachers back into the classroom. And that seems to me like it could be an immediate kind of fix for the need for more people. Uh, and I don't know if that's you know something that you want to discuss or. Right. I, I... Uh, I believe the bill you're talking about was introduced by Jay Nichols of the VPA. Um, but one of the, so I, I think that's the bill. Um, yeah. In terms of in in terms of bringing uh, retired folks back, I I think it's um, when it if if they feel safe, you know I think our retired folks are have historically been our best substitute teachers in my experience. Right? They know the school. They know the kids. Um, I think that's one thing to be thinking about. I do think, as Jeff mentioned, we're, we're going to be nationally at a crisis level of teachers wanting to retire earlier than expected. So um, I do think we have to look at the workforce in, in that way. So, Which brings me to a, an, another point because I, I've just begun the process of introducing 
introducing a bill that would um, allow for, um, excuse me, I'm losing my, uh, my video here, I think, allow for um, loan forgiveness for um, people who go into teaching and right. will stay in the state. So I'm hoping that that gets some traction. I, I think that would be extraordinarily helpful. I think one of the, the financial aspects of the profession are one of the things that keep young folks out of the profession because they see opportunities elsewhere. Um, I do think we need to um, be creative about how we bring folks in. I, I do wanna caution, however, as former chair of the Vermont Standards Board for Professional Educators, that in some states they have wanted to lower standards for folks as they come in. And Vermont has a very proud and rich tradition of holding our educators to a high standard for entering the profession. And I, you know, I think that we need to maintain that because our children and youth deserve the best teachers and the, the standards board is the gatekeeper for that. So, and I think that would be true whether you're bringing somebody back out of retirement or recruiting someone elsewhere. Thank you. And, and to speak just briefly to Senator Lyons's point, one of the reasons we're doing all the work and the, um, with social emotional well-being and, and shifting the mindset of the education workforce is we probably couldn't find enough mental health counselors to deal with all the issues. So we need to have the time, the resources devoted so that everyone in the school is thinking in terms of social and emotional well-being. And then those uh, students and staff who need uh, more direct mental health services that they are, are directly available. But we're not, we can't expect all of all the behavioral issues and all of the uh, trauma cases to be addressed by a mental health counselor. We have to do that community wide. So we'll continue that work. I hope, I hope that's helpful. Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Campion, uh, Colin and Jeff and Don, nice to meet you. Um, I took some notes. I'm not all that well, my thoughts are not all that well organized. I was listening as the three of you gentlemen were speaking. Um, so I think I'll just sort of popcorn a few of my thoughts here um, and things that are important to uh, myself as a committee member. And I think many of our constituents, um, number one, um, uh, and we talked about it in health and welfare, uh, but you know, just as we have a nursing shortage and we need to figure out a way to do a better job of uh, retaining our college age uh, young adults and encouraging them if they go, go to school out of state, come back home and give us a opportunity. We have to figure out a way, uh, I believe, to keep uh, young uh, aspiring teachers in, uh, in the pipeline uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but it's a, a problem that I think that we can all recognize that uh, we, we are losing too much talent to other states because they choose to go to college elsewhere. And then, you know, it's for one reason or another, they don't come back home and give us a shot. Um, number two, uh, broadband, broadband, broadband. Uh, you know, we can't say it enough. It's uh, to me, it's um, uh, one of those uh, um nonpartisan issues. I mean, everybody uh, and any elected official should recognize in 2021 that we need to do better for uh, all residents and that um, impacts um, our, uh, our students so much, especially with them being home. Uh, I have four children, two of which are in elementary school. And, you know, I, the struggle is real, as they say, uh, with broadband. And I live, I don't live, I live in Rutland town. I don't live in a rural community that, you know, struggles with those, uh, those issues every day. Um, so there's that, um, and, uh, Senator Campion, if I go off on a tangent, keep me in check here. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, meals for, for children, lunches, especially, you know, I, it, to me, there's nothing more heartbreaking than, than hearing the story of a child going home hungry or not, not having a meal. Uh, as one of you said, uh, we know that, uh, good nutrition leads to good education and, and good participation and so on. So that's, that's an important issue that, uh, you know, the school has to 
the school of 30, 40, 50 years ago to me isn't, isn't what it, you know, is today. It's, it's uh, for their education, it's for their psych psychological needs, it's for, you know, their best, some students, unfortunately, the best meal of the day is what they get in the cafeteria at lunchtime. Um, and then, um, you know, the retired teacher um, idea is, is a good one. And I think it's almost heroic for some of these um, teachers to come out of retirement, come back in the classrooms with the risks of the pandemic, um, especially if they're in that 65 plus age range and they choose to. And I would love to see these folks, if they choose to come out of retirement, uh, have the state figure out a way that they could become part of that 1A or 1B or whatever the category is for the vaccines. Because if they're, if they're coming back into the classrooms, we know in a normal year what the stomach bug and the flu and everything else that circulates a classroom in January and February, you know, now to think that a teacher coming out of retirement could possibly be infected with the coronavirus, especially at a later stage in, in their life. I mean, it would be, it'd be heartbreaking. Um, and obviously, uh, it, it's my opinion, along with many, that um, funding education is critical, but funding it uh, fair and equitably across the, the board is important as well, because our property, many property owners feel that taxes are too high, and that could be a deterrent for keeping people in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, I would just ask a question here, not that, um, uh, not that we need to solve this today, but I wanted your opinions. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I heard from a constituent during the campaign, and I heard the other day from another constituent as I dropped my daughter off at school. Um, the, both of these parents were in favor of um, putting seatbelts on school buses. Now, I don't have, I don't think I have an opinion either way. I hadn't, hadn't even thought about it until these two different people brought it up. But um, if the NEA had a position on that uh, for or against, and um, you know, like I said, this is the first time I've even brought this up in a legislative session. So I hope I didn't blind, blindside anyone, but thoughts on that. Well, that's an interesting question. I know uh, Senator Perchlick from Transportation is also on this committee. I don't know if he wants to weigh in here, but we'll start with uh, the NEA. Do you have a position on that? On, on the seatbelt issue? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, uh, well, it's on the table. Yeah, no, no, it's fair. There's, uh, no. Thank you, Senator Terenzini. You put a lot on the table. It's good, good <laughs> rich discussion to have, certainly. Uh, the seatbelts on the school bus, I've never understood why they're not there, frankly. I mean, when my kids were little, you know, they were buckled in and, and, and should be. Uh, and so I think, and they remain so. And now it's, it's part of their DNA, right? I mean, they get into a, a car and they drive and they put on a seatbelt. It's who they are. And I think the same could be uh, over the long course to, to get these kids on a school bus in a seatbelt. There must be some reason. I'm not aware of why there isn't. And so um, I'll just, maybe somebody here does. I do not. Senator Perchlip, did your committee, has, have you ever looked at this? Yeah, it, it has come up. I can't remember the reason. I, I, I know some school bus, school bus have seat belts, so it's voluntary and it's not required. So I, I'm not sure why, but I do remember we talked about it, but uh, Senator Chitton and I can bring it over to that committee and, and bring it up. I know we regulate the colors of the buses all down to the very details. So we definitely could do it, but I, and I know we've talked about it. I just can't remember why it was decided not to make it a requirement. Well, I, I, I appreciate I, that. Senator Lyons, do you know something no, about this? No, you know, I, I don't know how far it goes, but when I was on the school board, it was all, all about um, whether or not we were going to buy a school bus with seatbelts and all the pros and cons of it. And ultimately was an individual school decision or school board decision or supervisory district decision. It's probably still that way. Um, and I don't know whether the Department of Health has a, a policy on that or not, but and that'll be fun in uh, transportation to take that one up. <laughs> Another so, committee for us to enter into. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if Senator Terenzini is going to have a, a bill drafted about this, but maybe in the meantime, Senator Persley, if you could just give us maybe tomorrow, if you have time just to check in and give us a little bit of an update. I mean, Keep it simple, five to ten pages, little PowerPoint. Just <laughs> well, Senator Campion, I, I hope I didn't open a real can of worms here with the seatbelt. Uh, no, question, no, no, I, I, it, no, it's, it's it, some. It was just interesting to me that I heard it twice uh, yeah, from yeah. different constituents. So it must be it must be on the minds of some people out there. Yeah. 
Good point. So any other questions related to anything uh, right now while we have these folks here uh, as it relates specifically to COVID? Um, Senator Chinton. I just have to say I'm married to a teacher and uh, she has been working double time uh, and I just want to thank all the teachers that you represent for everything they've been putting into delivering quality educations during this pandemic. And I'm interested to hear from the NEA as we go forward, the durable changes. So what we've learned from this pandemic and what we want to see persist even post pandemic. I know she commented how teacher student conferences have actually been a lot easier to perform with, with these virtual platforms now that everybody has been accustomed and tuned to them. Uh, but I think that's a, a lessons learned that I look forward to having the discussion of after we get out of this uh, this pandemic. So thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, Jeff, uh, I'm not sure this should go to you, but one of the things we've heard now from multiple groups, we've heard from Secretary French, the Principals Association, other associations about what needs to happen. Is there a committee that is working together uh, sort of that, that's putting together something that's saying, okay, this is what we need and this is what we're going to do. This is collectively what we need from appropriations. You know, I've heard things about summer programs, pilot programs, assessment, mental health, but sort of a, a, a COVID slash post COVID committee, or is, I, I just don't want everybody working in their own silos. That's what I'm trying to get at. And the Principals Association put together some really good points yesterday. You're all raising good points. How is that going to happen? Well, it, it should happen. I'll say that. And I, I could not agree more. And we do. I mean, unfortunately, we're all working in our little Zoom silos. And, and sure. uh, we used to meet regularly with the, the folks over at Two Prospect, the superintendents, school boards, and principals, and special ed directors. And, and, and we don't anymore um, for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, I just spoke with Jeff Francis and, and Jay Nichols an hour and a half ago, whenever it was, two hours ago. Um, and, and so we do speak with them. We should probably, and I, your point is well taken, we should be coordinating how we want to focus our attentions and energies. There are, we do have disagreements. I'm not going to say that we don't, sure. but uh, on, on a large host of issues that you've just outlined, we should be on the same page and probably are and ought to be working together with the administration and, and, uh, uh, Commissioner of Health, for example. Yeah, and I think Senator Kitchell would also probably, I don't want to speak for her, but after my meeting with her yesterday, I think people would just appreciate, you know, hey, we've all come together, and these are the seven points that we can agree on, and this is, you know, uh, the, the amount of money that it's going to take for us to run these things uh, as we deal with COVID between now and everyone being vaccinated and somewhat back to normal, and then kind of a, a post-COVID kind of world. So I don't want to just say, I want to leave it with all of you, but I'm wondering if maybe uh, just, I guess, let us know also how best to help facilitate this conversation. But I don't think it's a conversation that should happen in committee. I think ideally you will all come to us, uh, you know, uh, with, with some kind of plan. And I don't know if you're all willing to take the lead on that or if I should reach out to Secretary French or, or how best to do it. How about this, uh, Senator? I will I will take it. I've, I've got a note to myself, and I'm going to reach out and and uh, just we do meet with uh, the Secretary of Education on Fridays, all of the groups, right. and that's been going on since is it March or April. I don't feel it feels like forever uh, on a weekly basis on Fridays. Um, but we have, I mean, th those have been frankly just very critical needs of the week. You know, closing sure. schools in the spring, reopening them in the in the in August September issues of masks and, and all that athletics and all the fun stuff that go into running a school and questions for the secretary and the superintendents and us and everybody. So that, that might be a nice place to do it. But I think initially I, I, I will uh, promise you, I'm going to reach out to my, my colleagues, if you will, at uh, two prospect and start that conversation with them. Thanks. I'd appreciate that. And so what I'll do is I'll loop back to Senator Balance, Senator Kitchell's and Senator Lyons when I see her uh, and say, Hey, these are the, Jeff Bannon's working on this and he'll be back in touch with us to, to help uh, so that we can be helpful to kind of facilitate this so we can all get one thing going. Right. And I know Don just, wants to just, say something. Just, yeah. I just wanted, you know, one quick example. I've met, I've met twice now with Jeff Francis and Jay Nichols and Heather Boucher. 
uh, uh, specifically on the truancy issues that we're, we're seeing right now. And that's where we began talking about regional approaches, what, what resources are necessary. So right. as we begin to look at those issues, I think it's very natural that we begin to, to figure out, okay, here are the resources we need. Is, could this be something community schools are addressed? Do we need, you know, case, we need a case manager in each district to handle just the truancy issues because that lack of engagement with students. So really like that approach. And I think we'll, we can, you know, make that work as we begin to see which I, issues are identified and, and what we need to address those. Great. And, and the truancy issue is big. I mean, upwards yeah. of 30 to 40% in some places. Yeah. Huge. And it's scary. You know, I mean, I think I've been, made it clear my uncle is a principal at the elementary school in Hardwick and I know that you know I he hasn't talked to me about truancy but he's just talked about you know the kids that are kind of are off their radar and normally it, right. these are children that would be on their radar and they can check in and um, I think unless there are uh, final questions from the committee I think we'll leave it there for today since we I do want everybody to just uh, I was reminded uh, today by uh, leadership give everybody a moment to stretch before we have Joyce Judy uh, join us in just about 10 minutes. But any other final questions, comments? Thank, oh, Senator Hooker. Just please. before um, the group goes, please. Uh, with regard to reopening schools in yeah. April, uh, I think I'd, I'd like information on what you think will be the standard for giving the go ahead or for feeling comfortable enough to have everybody back in school in April. And just to give you some uh, information there, yesterday we asked that question of Secretary, of Dr. Levine. And, um, you know, I, I think generally, I don't have my notes right in front of me, but he was looking at community spread and, you know, spoke pretty generally. So it would be interesting to hear also the kinds of things that you are all um, thinking about. I don't know if you have a, a sentence or two now to mention, Jeff, um, or if you'd prefer to come back. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I mean, the vaccines are critical. Uh, we're, we're open now. Let me just reiterate that. And this yeah. is about getting everybody in person at the same time yeah. after the April break. And I think the, the other question we have is um, that's not answered yet, and we need to answer it before we do, is what, what about the families who don't want to send their kids back to school for various and good and valid reasons? Are teachers going to then have to work yeah, two jobs, if you will, and we think that's a real concern. The superintendent raised superintendents raised it last week with Secretary of Ed, and uh, so there are. It's not just metrics about how you get back in, but it's sort of the details about how you do open once you think it's safe and everybody's vaccinated, which is part of the safety issue. Okay, we'll leave it there. This is helpful, um, and I appreciate Jeff you taking the lead with uh, your colleagues and the other. Uh, departments and also working with the agency to help us come together with with a plan um, that would be great and feel free to be in touch with me or any of us uh, uh, for assistance along the way and then maybe we can touch base early next week just to see how things are it's, it's, it's going to work out that way okay I'll see I'll see everyone else uh, in uh, Senator Campion yes please would you please remind everyone to shut off their video and mute themselves for the break absolutely uh, you heard it there first. So uh, thank you, Jeannie, for that. And we'll see you all back in about five minutes. So just a couple of things that people brought up that I just want to let you know, uh, information is on its way. Uh, we're going to get a briefing this week um, on broadband. I, I don't remember if it's tomorrow or Friday, but I've asked uh, June Tierney to come in, talk to us. A lot of that work is, is done on finance, but we certainly, uh, should uh, need to play a role. Um, and then also a little bit about uh, property taxes and education funding. I know some of us have been through these kinds of uh, how it works conversations, but they're always uh, a good reminder. And I've asked Treasurer Pierce to come in also to talk about uh, pension liabilities, bonding, and her role with this committee. So these, this is informational stuff that'll be coming. But uh, let's uh, continue our discussion. It's great to have President Joyce Judy of the Community College of Vermont with us uh, for a conversation about our community colleges, our community college system. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, President Judy called me yesterday after hearing that 
you know, perhaps it might be considered in some way through with our committee and other committees, um, giving students an additional year of, uh, of high school or giving them a free year at CCB, if that were to make sense. Um, we also talk a little bit about partnering with perhaps with the Biden administration. Uh, if, if they are putting out pilots or if they, there are, is funding going for, coming uh, from the feds on reducing the tuition costs and just the community college in general, uh, what's happening now what sorts, what it is, how it works, uh, you know, a little bit about your own personal history would be great as well, President Judy, and um, what you might be seeing on the ground right now with regard to COVID and classes uh, as, a, as a college institution. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks for joining us, um, and uh, we're thrilled you're here. Great, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm Joyce Judy, I'm president of the Community College of Vermont. And um, as uh, Senator Campion said, he and I were talking last night, he suggests I come in and give a little bit of an overview of CCV, um, although um, there are many familiar faces on this committee. And so some of you probably could give this um, overview as well as I can. So um, I'm grateful to that. I'll give you a little overview, then I'll talk, um, really specifically about our uh, dual enrollment early college and then a little bit about um, the McClure Foundation gift that was given um, to high school, to graduating seniors. And then I'm happy to answer questions, go in any direction. So um, really this is intended to be a conversation. I'm not here to pitch anything because um, Senator Campion said it would just be great to have people have a, just a general baseline of what the, who and what the Community College of Vermont is. So just to give you a little bit of a background, um, CCB actually celebrated its 50th um, anniversary last year. And if anyone had told me um, last February, when we actually were in the State House to celebrate our 50th, that we would be um, celebrating our 50th with nine months of our centers essentially being closed, mm -hmm. um, I would have thought people were nuts. But instead, um, we did, but what has been really, really fascinating is CCV is as strong or stronger than ever. So I am incredibly proud of our staff and faculty for the way we've been able to, to take advantage of what's going on in the environment and build on it. But, um, you know, we are, we are 50 years old and um, at the time when we were created, um, Governor Dean Davis's vision was how do you take and provide a college education to, to Vermonters in there locally? Um, and the challenge is do it in a really rural state. And so, you, you know, how, how do you do that? Um, and his, you know, core, core belief was that Vermont communities are incredibly rich. And um, with talent, you take people that are interested who are practitioners put them in a classroom with people that are highly motivated to learn and you really have something special. And I would say that core value has carried us through for 50 years. Now we, we look a lot different and we've made a lot of changes. Um, back um, in the seventies, um, tuition was free and faculty taught for, for free, except they passed ahead at the end of a class. And if you were, if you were, if you hit the mark, you might get um, a donation. If you didn't, you might not. And if you had, you know, all those iterations. So, but we've come a long way. And today, I think probably most of you know that we are the second largest college in the state of Vermont next to the University of Vermont. Um, but one of the things that I'm particularly proud about is we serve more Vermonters than any other college in the state. We serve, and that is our population. 95% of CCV students are Vermonters. And I would dare say that the the other 5% are not people who came here for their education, but moved here and haven't been here for 12 months. So they don't qualify for in-state tuition. Um, the other handful or two is we always have some international students who came here for an international experience at one school and it didn't work out and they, they continue using their J-1 visas at CCB. But essentially um, CCV has um, in a, in a Pre-COVID environment and a post-COVID environment, we have 12 centers throughout the state of Vermont. Um, so we have 12 physical centers um, and we have always prided ourselves in being um, 
within 25 miles of 95% of the state's population. So it is, um, we are a statewide entity and people can um, find their way to us um, relatively easy. One of the things that is uh, really, and was just so fortuitous for us, particularly with it, given this current environment is that we, we started our first online course in 1996, long before it was, you know, it was popular. Um, at the time we actually piped in Senator Leahy um, from Washington, um, you know, with, it was duct tape and orange juice cans and everything, but we thought that was the coolest thing. And today it would be, you know, pretty standard, but, but we, we decided that we wanted to get into online, online education because it was another way of increasing access to Vermonters. So yes, we struggle with broadband and I heard, you know, some of the earlier comments. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a huge challenge, but, but providing online and remote education still provides opportunity for so many who would struggle with having to physically go to a place. So we were pre-COVID uh, nearly 50% of the, we run about 700 to 800 classes a semester and um, almost 50% of them pre-COVID were online. So it was really, it, that was never our intent to necessarily grow it that way. It's just, you know, we're consumer driven. And so students were, that is the way many, many students um, choose to learn. But we, we feel like we have created a, a niche with online. Our classes are small. We require a lot of um, interaction. And we're one of those odd places we take attendance online. So students have to participate um, two or three times a week in their classroom, in their classes with interaction. Um, it's not synchronous, it's asynchronous, but, um, but because you know one of the responsibilities that we have is I believe that we need to help um, learners become good learners and strong learners. And so providing that discipline and structure is part of our, our program. So this past fall, we had more than 5,000 students um, enrolled in um, more than 700 classes. And our enrollment, we bucked the trend um, nationally. Many community colleges, and as you know, many um, uh, traditionally based colleges were seeing a significant decrease in enrollment. And CCV actually was written up nationally because we did not see that. We actually saw um, just a tick up above um, last fall. So um, our enrollment has held steady. And you know, when I was interviewed for a couple of publications, they said, so why do you think your, your enrollment grew? And I said to them, I'd like to know why our enrollment grew and give them an answer. The same way when, our, when enrollment doesn't grow, you want, you'd like to be able to point to something and say, this is why it did, or this is why it didn't. I feel like we put some stuff in place that I'd like to point to that, do, that did believe um, or helped us um, grow. But um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to point to all of those things. Um, but to give you a sense of our students, we serve a huge diversity of students. And again, as I mentioned, 95% of our, our students are um, Vermonters. Our average age right now is around 27. Um, it used to be like 30, 31. But one of the things that's been very interesting for us is for years, we saw very few traditional age students. But today, 50% of our students are between the ages of 18 and 22. So we are seeing a huge number of traditional age students. And you know, I attribute that to a number of things. And one clearly is economics. People can come to CCV. They can do their first two years or the equivalent of their first two years and then transfer. They can transfer to another Vermont State College. They can transfer to the UVM. Um, UVM, we have, we have tons of articulation agreements. UVM actually posts on their website, this UVM courses and the CCV equivalents because there's so much um, traffic between the two. So it is a way to, um, you know, by starting at CCV or a community college, it, it, it does make a college education far more affordable than, um, than other options. And as you can imagine, um, we see a, a very high significant number of our students are first generation, usually between 60 and 70% of our students are first generation. Um, we um, are particularly proud of the number of veterans we serve. Every semester we serve more than usually right around 400 military military connected students. 
So, um, you know, that's, we have, and we've gotten a lot of philanthropic support to provide special support to our veterans and, and our veteran programs. And we are particularly proud of, of our track record with, um, with veterans. Um, in addition, um, because we have a very large presence in Chittenden County, um, we also see, um, we have 21% of our students in Chittenden County are, are minorities. And um, we see a tremendous number of new Americans um, and um, I would say that if you walk into our, in, in pre-COVID or post-COVID times, not during COVID, um, you will see an incredibly diverse population, particularly in our Winooski Center, but throughout the state. But I would say that um, particularly in, um, in um, Winooski, and that is another thing that makes us incredibly proud that we have, that we have established an environment that is open and responsible respectful and accessible to, to all students. Um, just in terms of a couple things related to the COVID environment. So we, um, we moved from offering about 50% of our courses on in person, on ground, to we, as, as all of us had to um, in higher ed and in K-12, um, moved to um, remote learning in March. Um, but we did it um, in a way that we offered five different um, options for on for remote learning. So we have our traditional online courses, um, which, which are all asynchronous. And we, we also have, um, and we had started this pre-COVID, but we really have accelerated. And I actually think this is going to be one of the silver linings of, of COVID, that this is going to become an incredibly popular format, is a combination of synchronous and online. So synchronous where people actually have some structure and they get to meet with their class, get to meet with their um, faculty member. It's all, of course, this is all on a remote, but it gives you that structure. You can have a real sense of a class. And then the, another part of the class is all online. So for people that like are energized by a classroom environment, they get that synchronous um, piece. Um, but for our adult students, and when I talk about adults, I mean, they're 18 or to 80, because we think of all of our adults, all of our students as adults, because um, none of them, or very few of them, would identify themselves as, um, if you asked them, if you met them on the street and you say, what are they doing? Um, none of them would say, I'm a full-time student, and then I'm doing this. They would say, you know, I'm working at so-and-so, I'm a parent, and oh, by the way, I'm going to school. And so when we think of our students, we think of them all as adults. Um, because they have multiple, multiple responsibilities. And so I think for adults, removing, having to travel and um, be in a place um, um, at a given time each week um, presents some challenges, particularly for students for whom their schedules, they have children, transportation. So I do believe that the synchronous um, online option is going to continue to grow in popularity for us. Um, the third um, format that we've been doing is hybrids. We actually, for some of our lab courses, there's mostly online and an occasional on-ground component. So it's face-to-face. -face. We also did, we're starting to do a lot more accelerated courses, which can be completed in seven weeks. And as you know, I mean, that's just the culture of today. People wanna do stuff really fast. They'll do it intensely and then move on. And so for students, who are looking, who, who just either want to get through their program pretty quickly, or they know for the next seven weeks, I can really focus on this, but I don't know after the next seven weeks. Um, and then the final one, and we um, um, got some terrific support from some philanthropists to launch this, is what a program that we call FLEX. And it's built at, it's modeled after some programs, particularly in Kentucky, around um, workforce development, where adults can start um, there are multiple start dates. So there's five different times you can start a course over the course of a semester, but here's the key. Everybody has to finish at the same time. So we have some students who you just know that the first two months of their year, September and October are really busy, but once November comes, I can focus for two months. And so um, it's been pretty amazing. We offered just, we did a soft launch of three courses last spring we're running 15, we ran 15 courses this fall. 
and we'll be running more this this spring. So it's uh, it's interesting because adults can then they don't have to start at the same time. And giving, I think the key for us is building in as much flexibility as we can with students. Um, but so we try to make it as easy as possible for students to attend, but the rigor and the, the, um, the challenges have to be there because no matter what, we need to prepare students for the next step. So whether they're gonna transfer or whether they're going into a job or they're there because their company sent them, um, the rigor and the standards have to be there. So on the front end, we wanna, we wanna remove as many barriers but then just make sure that, um, that students are getting what they need. I'm just going to um, talk just briefly about um, some of the work we're doing with um, secondary ed, because I have to say that I am, this is where Vermont has excelled um, in terms of thinking, being very progressive. And I'm really grateful to the legislature for, for seeing this, their way forward to fund dual enrollment in early college um, early on. Um, this past fall, there were 800, we had 830 students who were enrolled in dual enrollment courses. And last fall, we had 819. So normally in a given year, we serve about between 15 and 1600 students in dual enrollment courses. So dual enrollment means that a student, this is, you know, the funding from, from the legislature where a high school junior or senior can take up to two classes um, during their junior or senior year um, college classes. And what it does is it, for me, it does two things. One, it helps so many students who didn't imagine that they could do college work. It gives them a chance to, to experience that. And also, um, it, you know, they can, students who are very savvy can take those six credits and train, you know, and when they enter college, they now have six credits that they can use towards their degree. And for some, you know, it's, you know, they struggle with a course in college or all of a sudden they, they instead of taking five or six courses, they can take four. Um, it just gives them a lot more flexibility. Um, the other piece that I would say is just an incredible thing and I think it will continue to grow. Um, so in fall of 14, the legislature funded the program called Early College where high school seniors can take their entire senior year. It's part of Act 77 to you know, flexible pathways, students for whom high school is not working for whatever reasons. Socially, they've exhausted the academic program. They just need a different environment. So in fall of 14, we had 56 students statewide enroll in early college. And this fall, we had 176. So it, um, you know, and for these students, they get a full year of college. And the stories that we continue to collect of students for whom this has made the difference between them, they and their families deciding that they could go to college um, and it's made it so affordable. Um, I will say that, um, and the continuation rate for early college is pretty incredible. Um, so student, um, and this is based on, it's not based on this past year's data because we, we try to collect it longitudinally. 71% um, of students who have enrolled in early college have continued that next year. Um, that's pretty high. Um, and so we are, what we haven't done is the next step to see if they just took a semester off and come back, but this was, they continued right on. And so we are, um, you know, um, I've, I can't tell you how many students have said to me or how many families, like our, because of early college, my family can now afford to send my kid to school, to college. Um, it's just, it's hugely beneficial. And um, so we, uh, we are particularly, this is an incredibly strong program and it says something about Vermont. Um, we just need to do more of it. One of the things that we are um, trying to figure out is, um, you know, I think all of us, if you look at all the national data and Vermont's the same, you know, we all struggle with keeping young men engaged and we've got to figure out how to do more with even early college and dual enrollment around um, this is, we've started to really begin to focus on what are the strategies that we can do in working collaboration with, with K-12 schools um, around um, young men, because it's a huge challenge. I mean, we have, we have a number of young men, it's not that we, you don't see, but if you look at the percentages, you know, CCV is very similar to most colleges 
you know, we're, well, it fluctuates between 65 and 70% women. And, um, you know, the, and, um, you know, I would say that that is wonderful on one hand. And, you know, how do we reach a broader population, I think is, is, a, is a challenge. So then the, my final um, piece that uh, Senator, um, uh, drawing a complete blank campion, uh, I was going to say Senator Bryan, but I was knew that it that wasn't quite right. Uh, yeah, was um, you know we have for years um, had a very close relationship with the Jay Warren and Lois McClure Foundation. We have we consider them a partner. They have been incredibly supportive of our work. You know, I think it's a it's a match because they're so concerned about access to college for all Vermonters. They're just an incredible. Um, foundation and just really thought, thoughtful folks. So they came to us and said, um, we want to do something. This was like in the middle of May. So we're not talking about this happening in March or April. They said, we want to do something really special for the class of 2020. We feel like they have missed out on their final three months of their senior year, no proms, no sports, no nothing we want them to know that we care and that Vermont cares about them. And so they came forward with, um, and we're gonna, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna offer all high school graduates a free course at CCV so that we know, they know that somebody cares and that has realized that they, um, and so they may, the simplicity of the program is amazing and I think is what, really made it so successful. There were no income guidelines and there were no guidelines, no, um, like you can only take these courses or these courses or whatever. Nope, if you were, a, if you graduated from high school in 2020 and you could register to take any course you wanted at CCD, any, and, and now I have to have to, there's one, you know, pause there, any course that they're eligible to take. So students still had to take our assessments to, or they had to give us their high school um, transcripts. So, you know, if you struggled with writing, you weren't going to take, you know, English comp two. And if you, but essentially you could take any course, whether it was a three credit course or a four credit lab, we will, um, the foundation covered it. And so, um, you know, we, CCV over the last two or three years has, has seen about 300 June graduates enroll at CCV in the fall of, in the, in the following fall. This year, we, dub, we saw 600. Now, I don't, it's not something, you know, we're in an odd environment. I realize, you know, there's COVID, there's all kinds of things going on. So can we attribute the, th the doubling of that just to the McClure gift? No, of course not. But I think you can't dismiss that, that it did make a difference. And I think that the other thing that is always interesting to me about the Jay Warren and Lois McClure Foundation, they're always looking also to do the right thing philanthropically, but also how do they influence policy? And so I think that one of the things that they have been concerned about is the financial barriers of, of kids, of, of Vermonters going on to college. And you know, as as you all know, we're one of the most expensive community colleges in the country. And essentially, and you know, we're less than a thousand. But I always say to people, if you're budgeting, you need to budget a thousand dollars a course. And so for so many of our students, it's not I'm gonna go to CCV or I'm gonna go someplace else. It's I'm gonna go to CCV or I'm going nowhere. And so the sort of the secondary thing that the McClure Foundation wanted to see is if they remove finding if they remove the the cost, would they see an uptick? Because as you all know, we have one of the highest high school graduation rates in the country, and one of the lowest college going rates. And I have to tell you, you know, I've been at this job for a long time, and that is a nut that is really hard to crack. We keep working at it. We keep trying to make changes. We we change numbers. We see more. But do we see huge strides? No, you know, and we keep working at it. But they feel, you know, they wanted to test out if we removed, if we sort of got cost away a bit, would we see an uptick? 
Now, this is an Anna one. And so, you know, there's nothing that says that, yep, if you move around finances, that this will do. But if you look at that, you know, it's something to think about because they did remove finances and we saw a doubling. And I would also add that um, as you all did um, in September approved using some CRF funds to support adults who had been impacted by COVID to come and take a course and you removed the financial barrier and we saw 800 students enroll. So there is something to the cost that we none of us can, can ignore. Um, what we do about it, that's that's a bigger question. But I think that if we really wanted to, to make some changes around that college going rate, I think that um, we do have to look. It's not the sole piece, but, but finances can. So so the McClure Foundation was was a wonderful gift. Um, you know, they they extended themselves quite a bit to do it because someone said to me, will they be doing it for this next year? No, you know, this was this was a huge gift for them. Um, and they committed to it for for this past year, but there I I can't speak for the foundation, but I don't imagine that this is something that they would do again lightly because it it did it did stretch them. Um, but it was an incredibly wonderful gift. And you know, where um the McClure Foundation is right now putting out a flyer um, that I know they're gonna be planning to send to all legislators because it's got some pretty interesting testimonies from students um, for whom this made a difference on whether they were gonna go to school or not. And uh, um, it's pretty powerful. So I'm gonna stop there. As you can see, um, I'm not very passionate about CCV um, and I can talk forever about this, you know, we haven't talked about workforce. We, there's tons of things I could talk about, but I hope I've given you a little taste. And um, Senator Campion, are there things that you wish I had mentioned that I haven't? Uh, I, um, I think that sounds great. I just have, and I'm sure others have questions, but just quickly, how much was the McClure Foundation gift? Uh, well, how much did they give that covered that number of students? So here's the thing, they didn't give us a gift. They guaranteed so what we did is, so every student, so it was essentially 600 times, it was probably more than $500,000 that they covered. Okay. So they essentially said, we will cover this, you bill us. I mean, this is, you know, this is the beauty of philanthropy and people having money and doing with it what they want to do. And so they just said, you know, we're not giving you a set amount, but we are guaranteeing to every Vermont high school graduate, we will cover your course. So. Um, you know, so we had 600 and I can't remember, it's like 621. I don't have the exact figure in front of me. Some took three credits, some took a four credit course. So it wasn't just a straight thing. And then we just simply build them. Okay. So, so it was the with, simplicity uh, of it. It was yeah. wonderful. And roughly Pardon? half a million dollars. If, yeah, if, I'd say it was probably a little more than that, but that's just a rough. Provide. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Cheryl, uh, Senator Hooker. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, President Julie. Uh, do you know how many of those 600 plus kids went on? Just well, that's a perfect question because right now we are, we're gonna monitor that. We're just registering for our spring semester. Mm -hmm. So our spring semester starts in two weeks. So we, are, we will be monitoring that closely because that is an important question um, in terms of how many of them continue, how many continue this this spring, how many continue in the summer? How many continue in the fall? We're very curious about that. So um, we will be tracking that for us, for the McClure Foundation as well. And I'm sorry, I missed the um, number of students that CCV has, the total CCV number. has, um, in a we well, in a given semester, we have more than 5,000 students enrolled. We serve about 10,000 Vermonters a year because we have three big semesters. We have a fall, we have a spring, and then our summer is is half again as big as our um, spring and summer. And so what's interesting about community colleges, as you can imagine, we don't admit a class and they'll be with us for four years. We put out a course list three times a year and people come and they register. So, you know, it's, um, we, there are some students who continue on, you know, they enroll full time and they're going to go through and finish in two years, but 80% of our students are part time mm -hmm. and they are in and out. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that um, one, of, I think one of the big changes in higher ed 
today, and it was, um, I think, um, amplified by COVID. I think we're going to see, there will always be the Middlebury's and UVM's and Dartmouth's of the world where they accept students and they will enroll and plan to be there for four years. But then I think there's a pretty big swath of people who will be enrolling in college, getting a degree, getting, getting a credential, getting a degree, going to work, coming back, being passed over by uh, several promotions. I will tell you that is a big motivator. They come back, they get enough education for what they want, they leave again. I just think this in and out. Um, so all the metrics, things like graduation rates and you know retention rates, those aren't so meaningful to community colleges um, because of our population. There are other things that are incredibly meaningful, but graduation and retention are less important to us than um, the success rate, for example, when a student registers and pays for a course in January, I wanna make sure they have successfully completed it when they leave. That probably is one of the most important measures for us. I'm a firm believer in education being a lifetime experience and CCV is certainly a, a area or a, an entity that adds to that. So thank you. Thank you. Senator Persley. Thank you. Uh, President Judy, the information that you gave on the average age and enrollment numbers, is that inclusive of the high school enrollees or that's just, that's without them? Um, the average age is with them. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, because that's one of the things that we've released, really, you know, that has made a difference with the number of students that we're seeing. Um, the average age, you know, when I, you know, I've, I've been at CCD for a while, and I will tell you, in the 90s, it was so rare for us to see a young student with a parent. And I got to tell you today, it is incredibly common. So the average age has dropped down. Yep. And you said 18 to 80, but I know you have 17 year olds because yes, I have a couple. Yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. a couple in your classes yep. now. Yeah. We had a student who, um, you know, a highly unusual student. We do allow younger students to come if they, for a variety of reasons. I think that this college environment is not for most young students, but he um, will be graduate. He graduated from CCV um, at the same time he graduated from high school. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're uh, right on the front lines of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Lyons, did you have your, I'm not checking, I'm not seeing your hand always raised when- uh, uh, you, The our, little yellow hand doesn't work. It just doesn't seem to be working. I don't know. No, but I, that's right. But but please go ahead. I know uh, eager to hear what you have to say. No, it's a quick question actually. And uh, first of all, thank you for your amazing work at CCV. It has grown so immensely with your leadership, uh, just in so many different ways, and we greatly appreciate that. And. And I can't believe that the 50th was a year ago. It, it feels like ancient history right now with all the COVID stuff. But um, my, my question is, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between our tech schools and uh, students going into CCV and how that sort of sugars off in terms of giving uh, kids uh, another step into um, a, a job? Yes, um, we do a lot with tech centers. And so now I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit, but it will give you a sense. So we think there are really three programs that fall under a broad dual enrollment umbrella. There's the dual enrollment program that is funded by the legislature. So you can take two courses and you can, um, and you come to CCV and you enroll in a CCV course. That's dual enrollment. And that is by far, you know, like um, in the fall, we had, I think there were 800 students in straight dual enrollment. Then we have what we say concurrent enrollment where students can, the, um, we work with faculty in high schools to offer a college course within, within the high school. So it's a, it's a high school faculty member um, teaching a college level course in the high school. And those are what they call concurrent 
of courses. The hard part about those is that students, on one hand, they get the content, but they don't get the experience. They're in with their peers. Um, it's, it's fine, but I will say for me, it doesn't do the same thing I want dual enrollment to do. I want people to think of themselves as different because if you've grown up with the same students for 11 years and you're still the class clown, you're still the class whatever, and you're in with other peers, it doesn't give, give you the same, the same experience. The third option, the third um, dual enrollment program is a program that we call um, Fast Forward that we work. It's funded by um, per Carl Perkins funds that come from the feds to the agency of education to CCV. And, um, and that's directly for tech center, tech center students and tech center programs. And so we work with tech center programs. There are certain programs that have been, if they have a qualified faculty member, that means they have to have a master's degree because anytime CCV does work in a high school, whether it's concurrent or fast forward, we have to, our accreditors make us treat them the same as we would treat any, any of our standard faculty. So faculty have to have a master's degree. They have to go through all the trainings that we require, all of that. But so we have worked individually with tech centers to, for some of their courses, those students, those tech center students get college credit for those. And that is a huge advantage. And so tech, we do a lot of work with tech centers. So in the, I will, I just have this form in front of me. Um, in the fall, in the year of 20, 1920, we had 200 and, no, 450 students um, who went through um, fast forward um, and took, like it's things like early childhood, um, computer courses, um, there's a number, and it's, and, it's, and it's center by center because it has to, it's faculty based because the faculty who is assigned to teach it and is willing, they teach to, Jenny, you'll know this, they teach to our essential objectives. They have, they have to abide by all of the things that um, CCV faculty do, but also CCV students. So all students have to take assessments. So, um, so we, what we're hoping um, and what we've hoped with, with the fast forward is it helps people, helps students who are in tech centers realize that they too can go to college and that they can leave the tech center with, um, with some college credits. So that's a, for us, that's a really important population because as we all know, um, a lot of students who are in the tech centers oftentimes don't think they're going to college. Oftentimes there's a lot of first generation students. And for those students, that's, that's a place where we really have put a lot of time and effort into that. So thanks for asking that question. Right, I, you know, and it, it, it certainly does get at the issue around workforce needs. Uh, we have so many right now. Uh, it's just, you mentioned childcare, but there's nursing and everything else. So thank you, thank you for that. I don't have any other question at this time. President Judy, you have sort of an interesting uh, frontline perspective on how our high schools are doing because you're seeing students right out of high school. Can you, and I, I've, I know I've talked to you a little bit about this in the past, but can you tell us how you feel our high schools are doing in terms of preparing students to, to enter CCV? Uh, are, you know, remediation levels, you know, what, what, what are you seeing? What, what are some of the strengths, weaknesses? It, it kind of goes back to your, earlier comment, we have this great high school, uh, you know, completion rate, but, you know, what, is, what does that mean? Is, does it mean um, that uh, we are giving, you know, it, it's a complicated question. It, yeah, it's complicated yeah. and I would say, you know, I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot to um, something because I would love to um, challenge this group to think about this. Mm -hmm. um, so we really try to partner with K-12 because, you know, it's easy to point to people and say, are you, you know, students, you didn't get, you didn't prepare students. And sure. so, you know, and so one of our, our issues, and this is why we, we work so hard with dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment and fast forward is how do we partner so that, that high school uh, faculty and, um, and people who work in the high school know what is expected and what do, what do, what do, kids, young people who are going on to college have to, what kind of skills do they have to have? But here's something that I do, th I think about this a lot. So, and um, 
You know, right now, and, and these are just, so if you don't hold me to these figures, but this is just what I have in my head. So right now, Vermont spends about $120 million on our senior year. So if you, and how I got that was, let's just say there are 6,000 students. And again, you know, there's maybe 5,000 now, but let's say 6,000 students and we spend $20,000 a year on a student. So, so, you know, 100 million, give or take. My point is, it's a, we spend a lot of money on the senior year. And, you know, my question is, you know, I think we can all point to situations where are we really, are students really getting, you know, $20,000 worth of an education? Because I think so many times, you know, like I've, I've been a good student and now I only have to get six credits or I only need this or I, you know, it's just, I don't think we have, and this isn't, and this isn't finding fault with K-12, I think this is just who we are, is that, you know, for the majority of students, I'm just not sure that we offer a really robust senior year. Yeah. And so I think as a, as a state, do we say, we're gonna commit to a really robust senior year and we're gonna set pretty high expectations for all seniors. Now, because cl clearly there are exceptions. There are people who are taking really, you know, really difficult courses and taking a really full load. But I also see there's a, you know, a pretty big swath of people that are just on cruise control through their senior year. And, it's, and the state is spending a lot of money. And so are there ways for us to think about the senior year in some different ways and make and either commit to, we're gonna have a really robust senior year or a bag in the senior year and we're gonna do service or we're gonna do something or we're gonna do something different because I just think the state spends a lot of money and, you know, I'm a believer that, you know, 17, 17, 16, 17 and 18 year olds, when I was there, you have a certain amount of energy and you're either going to put it productively or not so productively. And I just think that's a year when we should be challenging people as opposed to and setting pretty high expectations. So if I was going to wave a wand and really think about something, um, you know, and, that, and it's huge. But I, but I just wonder, is there a way for us to think differently about a senior year holistically? And again, there are individual situations where they have an, they're having an amazing experience. So this isn't, and again, this isn't finding fault with K-12. This is just how we've set it up. Um, but I think we could do a lot more. And so that's why like early college is one of those options where I feel like when students, instead of doing senior year, they have opted to have a really rigorous rigorous year. And so st individuals make those choices. And it's not always about, you know, and this is not, again, this is not about encouraging people to do early college. I think just making sure that there's a rigorous experience for that senior year, because then we launch people. They're going into jobs. They're going into the military. They're going into college. We want them fully prepared as opposed to having a year where they're sort of like mm, hanging out and then then they have to get re-engaged. So, so that's, you know, and, and I think about that amount of money and could we do stuff, could we think differently about that? Yeah, no, that's exciting to think about even, you know, uh, are there things that students could start coursework in their junior year and then they continue it at CCV or in another way? You and I talked a little bit last night, you know, civic education and how the, the country is rethinking I'm starting to think of it more as um, education for a democracy. You know, how do we, what sorts of things are we doing in our schools, CCV, you know, to make sure that students um, understand the importance of a democracy, you know, how to play a role in a democracy, those kinds of things. Yeah. You know. uh, questions, anything else, comments? Uh, Senator Terrenzini. Thanks, Senator Campion. Uh, President Judy, um, nice to meet you, first of all. Uh, sort of a question and maybe you can give us an answer and then I can ask this question to other um, people who come in testimony to uh, this committee. But do you think that um, things like uh, home ec and shop and some of these fundamental classes that just are not in high schools any longer that you know I got to experience, um, do you think putting these courses back in our high schools will, would prepare these young adults uh, better for a college setting, a community college setting and prepare them better for life in general? Well, I think anytime you can engage students 
in something that hits their passion, I think is really important. So do I think putting home ec and shop are the, are the answers to it? I don't know, but for some students, um, you know, having those skills is incredibly important. So how do we make sure that students get really practical skills as well as, you know, um, the more academic enriched programs? You know, um, I grew up on a farm and, you know, and my family still farms in New Hampshire. And, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I think about is how do we make sure that we engage? The most important thing I think is how do you keep kids engaged and touch their passion? And so, you know, to your question, you know, if someone's interested in shop, it's not about the shop program, but how do you make sure that that student can build on that passion and, and that curiosity? And so I, I think, I, you know, one of the things that I think is really hard is, you know, we bring kids in, in first and second and third grade and think how enthusiastic and curious they are. And how do we keep that going as opposed to, you know, going the other way? And so I think that for us as educators, the most important thing is how do you connect with students and how do you speak to their passion? Because you can teach as much math as, um, as you can in a class if you're in taking home ec or taking shop. You know, how do you, what's the context that you use to teach those skills? So, so. I don't know the answer to your question, except I do know that if we don't if we don't keep students engaged and, and work on their passions, we've lost them. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great response. Thank you. Anything else for President Judy? Uh, Senator Hooker, please. Just, just one more question about um, the early college. And that's been in, in effect for a few years. And um, can you give us the data on that as far as, and, and have you tracked whether or not these students have gone on and continued and received a degree or credentials or whatever? I can tell you the, the place that we, where we are tracking is that, um, uh, so the class of 1819, so this is, I just have this much, I didn't, I. Because when I would talk to Senator Campion last night, I was like, okay, like I need to get some pieces of data. But 71% of the students who, who were enrolled in early college um, in 1819 continued on the very next semester. So they kept going. Um, and that's a pretty high percentage. Um, and so we, you know, now what we haven't found, what we haven't gone back is, okay, did, did the remaining 20, 30% continue after a semester or two. So we just looked at did the, how many of the early college students just continued straight on. So we feel like that the continuation rate, and that's a much higher retention rate than you will find for most students going between their freshman and sophomore year with the population that um, are a lot first generation and many low income students. So we, we were particularly pleased about that, but um, we, the longitudinal data is stuff that we we have to get that from the, the clearinghouse and so you have to it, it takes a little bit okay so but, you're, but so it's a very good whether, question to know whether or not they've gone on even beyond that first year after is something that's that, what we we don't have that data okay um you. the other piece i will say and um i don't have it in front of me but i do know that we have tracked the number of students who are who take dual enrollment, take a dual enrollment course, and then take a course, go on to college. It's a very high number, but I don't have that right in front of me. Now, some people would say, well, those are students that would, that were inclined to go to college anyway. Um, but factoring that out, the fact that you were, we, we do see a lot of students who take dual enrollment go on. Um, it's, um, if we start going the other way, that would be a bigger problem. I also remember a course that CCV offered for seniors that um, was kind of a preparing to go to college. Yep. Is that still in place? Yes, and but now, thank you um, for asking that. We have a course called Introduction to College College Studies, or now it's called Introduction to College and Careers because when dual enrollment came, it used to be, as Senator Hooker remembers, it was for high school juniors and seniors, but we didn't have dual enrollment. 
-hmm. And so we had, um, when dual enrollment came along, we said, okay, we're gonna make that course available to high school freshmen and sophomores. And so now, and this is money, the, we run this course totally with support from VSAC and philanthropists. So this does not, and we usually run a few hundred students go through that course every year, but it's really intended to prepare students to take, to, to take a college course. And the difference is, is it for probably for many of us, you know, your families understood college, you knew the process, you knew how to apply to, you knew what financial aid was, you knew that financial aid was an option, you knew all those things. But for so many students, this is like a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And so Introduction to College and Careers um, focuses on sort of the language of, of college. How do you, how do you get through those that process. Also, how do I apply for financial aid? And then we've added um, um, a pretty strong career component. So people do um, a lot of career exploration in that. And again, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily one, you know, that you have to like decide early on what you're gonna do, but you should, but I do believe if you have a direction, um, you're much more, much more likely to stay focused um, if you have a direction, but I always say to students, but it's okay to change. My undergraduate degree was in animal science. So I rest my case, you know, <laughs> um, you can change, but it's the level of education and you learn to read and write and stay in, um, you know, in a context, it's really important. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, we're going to have a uh, uh, President Judy back next week with Brian Prescott and Senator Bruth, all of whom were involved with uh, on the Select Committee of Higher Education, which looks at um, higher education in general in Vermont with a specific look to CCB in the state colleges. Um, and so we'll be hearing more uh, from President Judy next week. Please. Senator Campion, can I just say one last thing? I, you know, I know that um, Chancellor Zanatny is going to follow me, and I yeah. want to make sure. You know, I realized that probably through my whole thing, I haven't really talked very much about the CCB is part of the Vermont State College System, and we do a lot of work, particularly with Vermont Technical College, in terms of students starting with us and transferring, particularly in the allied health field. Um, just a quick figure: seventy percent of of VTC graduates, nursing graduates. I mean, I don't have the latest figure, but two years ago, 70% of them had started at CCV. So we are, I always think of us, we're at the open end of the funnel and help people realize that they can do college, get started, and then continue on. And so we're really grateful to the relationship we have with the other schools. So Great. So thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you again next week. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Bye-bye. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. We'll just take a five-minute uh, break and then... Uh, Chancellor Zanotny, we'll have you in just five minutes, okay? Terrific, thank you. We're, we're grateful to have you here. Uh, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, you know, we know that uh, the state colleges are uh, going through a transition, if you will, um, experiencing some, some difficult times, also uh, experiencing some successes, I suspect, out there as well uh, at the institutions themselves. What we thought uh, we might do today, and as I think you heard me mention before President Judy uh, finished her testimony, we'll be hearing next week from the Select Committee on Higher Education with their recommendations uh, for the state colleges, uh, you know, how, you know, sort of assessing the state of where they're at today, how we might continue in the state, uh, having them uh, a part of uh, our landscape. So for you to come in today is terrific to give us, uh, it would be wonderful to hear a little bit about yourself um, as well as uh, the state colleges themselves, uh, how things are going in this COVID landscape, if you will, um, and anything else that you think we need to know about uh, the state institutions. And one of the things I'm sure you'll include, but if you would uh, just remind us uh, which institutions uh, comprise what we refer to as the state colleges, as uh, President Judy reminded us that CCV is part of the state colleges, and therefore I would suspect when we talk about appropriating funds to the state colleges, we are talking about an amount that goes to CCV as well as the institutions that you're going to talk about now. So 
with that, I also want to uh, welcome Catherine Lavasser, uh, formerly the Chief of Staff for the uh, Speaker of the House and in a new role here, which is uh, just terrific. So glad you're here as well, Catherine. Thank you. We do have some slides. So Catherine's going to manage the slides uh, for me as I go through this. So, um, so again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak with you all today and to give you an update on the Vermont State Colleges system and our COVID-19 response. So just going to Senator Campion's first question there, you can see on the slide, uh, the four institutions that make up the Vermont State Colleges system. So Northern Vermont University, which was created a couple of years ago from Johnson State College and Linden State College, then Castleton University, the Community College of Vermont and Vermont Technical College. So, um, As you may know, we have a new leadership team at the Vermont State College system. Uh, for the record, I'm Sophie Zadatny. I'm the chancellor of the system. I've been serving in this role since last summer. I was previously the general counsel uh, for the system. I've been uh, with the system since August, 2014. Uh, joining me today in the background is Catherine, as you know. Uh, she's our Director of External and Governmental Affairs, and she's uh, new to our team. She joined us this fall, and we're obviously thrilled to have her uh, as part of our team. So I just wanted to take a few minutes of your time at the beginning um, to share with you who we are and what we do, and then provide a brief update on our ongoing system-wide transformation. So there are three key points that I would like you to take away from today. Uh, the first is that the Vermont State Colleges are key to Vermonters' success. And I think some of that was illustrated by the testimony that you just heard from President uh, Joyce Judy. Uh, second, we are in the middle of significant transformation uh, that is being guided by the work of the Legislature's Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont. And again, I do understand you're gonna get more information about that next week. And third, we do serve um, um, more Vermonters than um, you know, other institutions uh, across the state. And we believe that Vermonters need more from the Vermont State Colleges moving forward. They need better access to continue their education, uh, more affordable and flexible options and more high quality opportunities that will help them succeed in life and do better to deliver for, the, for Vermont. So we've been serving Vermonters and Vermont communities for over 200 years. Um, we exist for the benefit of Vermont and we're working hard to do more and do better to deliver uh, for Vermont and the Vermonters that we serve. So as you know, uh, COVID-19 has created both a public health crisis and an economic one, and it has worsened our already significant and unsustainable structural deficit. So we already had a, a structural deficit prior to COVID um, but the, the pandemic has certainly put us in a, in a more challenging financial position than we were previously. Like the state, we have a, a position of extreme uncertainty regarding our revenue for next year. Um, our budget, um, about 78 to 80% of our revenue comes from students through tuition, room and board and fees. So um, given the challenges of the uh, pandemic, it does make predicting enrollment um, extremely hard. And um, again, because we, if we don't know what the enrollment's going to be, it really has an impact on our uh, ability to estimate what our, our revenues will be for the, the year ahead. Even though we're facing significant challenges this year resulting from the, the public health crisis and coupled with the, the structural deficit, we are committed to delivering for Vermonters. And especially now that the pandemic has increased the need for the services we provide in our host communities. So some examples of the ways that the Vermont State Colleges have been there for our neighbors during the pandemic include um, that at the start of the pandemic, we installed free community Wi-Fi hotspots in the parking lots of our residential colleges to help Vermonters work and learn remotely, uh, particularly for those who didn't have access to broadband. Uh, we hosted food banks and other related activities such as weekly community meals. We maintained access to Vermont Tech's dental clinic, which primarily serves low-income Vermonters without dental insurance. Our student teachers continued to serve uh, in placements across the state in pre-K uh, to 12 schools. And we also stood up a 2.3 million uh, CRF workforce initiative that was established by the legislature um, to provide free classes and trainings for Vermonters um, across all four of our institutions. 
and 971 Vermonters whose employment had been affected by the pandemic were able to take nearly 1,400 classes and trainings thanks to the investment from the state. Notwithstanding the challenges, uh, the Vermont State College system is essential to Vermont, uh, Vermont's economy and our state's future. Our mission starts with the phrase for the benefit of Vermont and we do take that mission very seriously. We have facilities and academic centers within 25 miles of nearly every Vermonter and the Vermont State College system is deeply rooted in every region of the state. The heat map on this slide shows where our students come from. It is very easy to fall into the trap of assuming that every college student comes from a stable middle income family. That every student has a home to go to when residence halls shut down due to a pandemic and that every student can afford a residential four year experience. And while we do serve many of those students, the reality is, is that the Vermont State Colleges serves all Vermonters. And again, I think from the testimony that you just heard from President Judy, um, you've got a sense for the scope of some of the students uh, that we serve. So this means that first gener generation students for whom a degree or credential isn't accessible unless they can commute to school after work, like Jessica Malski's, um, who shares that being a first generation student means you may have to work while attending school and you may have to face daunting tasks like completing the FAFSA on your own. We're able to, to um, accommodate them within our system. And our students' lives are complicated. Uh, we have new Americans, Vermonters recovering from addiction, and Vermonters who were unable to make it at a traditional four-year college. There are Vermonters who barely made it out of high school and then years later realized the dream of a college education in moving their lives forward. And that's a, for an example, we have uh, Jeff Patterson who didn't find success at a traditional four-year institution, uh, but he started over at the Community College of Vermont and he ultimately earned a bachelor's degree. We have Vermonters who have a chance to change their lives and break the cycle of poverty for their families because they have access to a Vermont State College. And we serve Vermonters who need a second chance. So for example, Kyle Wolf overcame a substance use disorder and incarceration and used his experiences as motivation to pursue higher education and help others. Kyle graduated from CCV with an associate degree in human services and is currently pursuing a degree in social work at Castleton. Vermonters returning from military service find a home at the Vermont State Colleges, and we have a strong reputation for being veteran friendly, as Sean Connolly shares here. Sean found the transition from the army to college challenging, and CCV and Vermont Tech eased his transition. We serve Vermonters from rural communities whose local Vermont State College makes higher education accessible. Rachel Burt found success at Vermont Tech in the Dairy Farm Management Program even though she thought that getting a degree would be overwhelming and exhausting. She's now immersed in the two plus two program and sees Vermont Tech as a step forward to the rest of her life. So these are just a few of the stories of who our students are and how we change their lives. And while the Vermont State College system primarily serves Vermonters, we do have many students that cross borders to commute or attend a Vermont State College system school as shown on this heat map. Educating over 10,000 Vermonters each year, our campuses are centers of academic excellence, culture, and community. Most importantly, 83% of our students are Vermonters. We educate more Vermonters annually than all other institutions of higher education in the state combined, and two thirds of our alumni live and work in Vermont. This past year, more than 1,800 Vermonters graduated from our colleges and universities with degrees and certificates and entered the workforce. This fall, we have almost 3,300 first-generation college students enrolled in the system, and we're educating almost 3,000 low-income undergraduate students. The Vermont State College system is the economic anchor that creates opportunities for vulnerable Vermonters. We create pathways to affordable certificates, degrees, and credentials, and provide economic stability in the rural regions of the state, where our colleges and universities are large employers and service community hubs. For over 200 years, the institutions of the Vermont State Colleges have filled an important role in our state, providing access to high quality post-secondary education to students of all ages, all income levels, and all backgrounds. So while we shared a couple of those stories with you today, there are thousands more. The Vermont State Colleges are economic anchors for the state and our host communities, and we employ nearly 3,800 people. 
As you can see here, our employees live in every county of the state, including in the communities you serve. As a state college system, we're among the largest employers in the state, next to the state of Vermont, the University of Vermont, the state's largest hospitals, and some of the largest businesses. And regionally, our colleges stack up as large employers as well, employing hundreds of Vermonters in our anchor communities. We offer competitive wages and benefits and are a significant employer from Vermonters of all educational attainments. Additionally, our top enrolled programs align well with Vermont's workforce needs, and that includes mental health professionals, childcare providers, entrepreneurs, educators, and healthcare professionals. So while the importance of the Vermont State College system to Vermonters is undeniable, the VSC does face significant challenges if it's to continue to meet the needs of Vermont and its students in the future. We've been affected by demographic and market challenges, and these have been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. With several campuses operating online only this fall, a steep drop in enrollment and increasing operating costs, the VSC is in a challenging financial position. We did receive significant bridge funding and CRF dollars this year from the legislature for which we're incredibly grateful. And with the bridge funding, uh, the legislature also established the Select Committee on the Future of Public Higher Education in Vermont. And the charge to that committee was, quote, to assist the state of Vermont in addressing the urgent needs of the Vermont State Colleges and develop an integrated vision and plan for a high quality, affordable and workforce connected future for public higher education in the state. So we have embraced that message that transformation must happen at the Vermont State Colleges, and we are taking needed initial action both in the Chancellor's Office and at our member institutions. We're continuing to work on initiatives to contain costs and to function more as a consolidated system and less as a federation. The work is ongoing and essential as we do our part to transform the Vermont State Colleges for the benefit of Vermont. And as we do this internal work, we will be working and looking at the direction given to us by the select committee and our board of directors, our board of trustees, I should say. Um, transformation will be achieved on many levels. And with that in mind, um, I wanted you to know that the board of trustees recently adopted a set of strategic priorities. The VSC is committed to becoming a fully integrated system that achieves financial stability in a responsible and sustainable way. The strategic priorities are focused in four key areas, affordability, accessibility, quality of academic programs and relevance of programs. And embedded within each of those strategic priorities is an intentional focus on diversity, equity and inclusion. We look to partner with the legislature as we collectively work to stabilize the system and prepare to build a better, stronger and more sustainable future for Vermont. Our goal is to achieve transformation in a transparent, fiscally responsible and thoughtful manner that enables us to continue fulfilling our mission. In addition to moving towards a system-wide budgeting process, our ongoing work to transform the Vermont State Colleges for the benefit of Vermont includes the development of a system-wide website of online and remote course listings so that students can more easily identify programs that fit their needs reducing competition and increasing collaboration between our colleges, including in admissions and financial aid awards, expanding a successful virtual library model to serve the entire system, analyzing our expensive software needs to ensure we're getting our return on investment and identifying further opportunities for program collaboration across the system. Uh, just briefly on December 4th, uh, the Select Committee released their initial report uh, the report contains several recommendations that the board is currently considering. The main recommendations include a common accreditation for the three residential colleges. So that's Vermont Technical College, Northern Vermont University and Castleton University. Um, and then the important with that, just because to emphasize this, because I know there's some confusion around it. Um, the select committee is recommending that we maintain the physical presence that we currently have. So they're talking about a common accreditation for three colleges. They're not talking about shuttering campuses um, in, in their proposal. Um, the administrative consolidation of services is something else that we're looking at, such as financial aid, marketing, and admissions. Uh, the select committee also recommends uh, a significant restructuring of our budget that includes steps to reduce our structural deficit, coupled with an increase in the base appropriation that we receive from the state 
and they're looking at um, accomplishing this in incrementally over five years. We are in the process of mapping out what this would look like for the Vermont State Colleges, and we're um, working with our board um, on how to address these recommendations. The next select committee report is due to the legislature on February 12th, and the final report is due April 16th. But I just want to be clear, based on the first initial report that we have, we are moving forward with exploring and investigating the recommendations that are in uh, the initial report. It's clear that we must innovate if we are to continue to fulfill our mission and transformation will be achieved on many levels. So we're looking at the select committee and it's coming reports to guide us as we shape our future. We're looking to direction from the governor, the legislature and the select committee as to our next steps. And we're working closely with Senators Kitchell, Baruth and the Senate Pro Tem. We're also working hard internally to streamline the state college system to better serve Vermont and Vermonters. And we have been and will continue to be in close and frequent contact with our union partners, our staff and faculty as we navigate the path ahead. Um, again, undertaking this work in the middle of a pandemic is incredibly challenging. And so with that in mind, I just wanna take a few minutes to update you on the work that we're doing to address um, the COVID-19 pandemic and to make sure that our campuses are safe for our students and employees. So with the exception of CCV, um, I'll explain that in a second, but with the exception of CCV, our colleges have worked closely with the governor's restart team and the Department of Health in developing mandatory guidance that's applicable to all colleges and universities in the state of Vermont. Uh, CCV has been exempted from the state's mandatory guidance because their classes have been taught exclusively online. Their students are all commuters and there's, there's no residential capacity at CCV and their employees have been working remotely to the maximum extent possible. So the comments I'm gonna provide now are, pertain to the other three institutions. Um, so if, looking back to the fall semester, we had a successful semester. We concluded in-person courses at Thanksgiving and sent students home. And then the remainder of the semester was completed online. Uh, we had good compliance with the mandatory guidance uh, issued by the administration and with the uh, college's individual institutional policies. Uh, those students and employees who failed to comply uh, did, were disciplined. Uh, we provided data on the number of uh, COVID violations and students removed from campus uh, each week, along with data from other Vermont colleges and universities, and that weekly data was provided to the administration. In the fall, we had the total number of positive cases we had for students and employees were 11 at Northern Vermont University, 11 at Vermont Technical College, and three at Castleton. Many of those occurred at the very tail end of the semester and were the result of community contacts and not due to an outbreak or cluster at any of the individual institutions. Looking ahead to the spring semester, um, the start of the semester has been delayed uh, to February 1st. Uh, we will be providing flexible course offerings across the system. And again, Joyce Judy mentioned some of these, but online uh, asynchronous courses, online synchronous courses, hybrid courses, uh, telepresence, uh, accelerated programs, as well as face-to-face -face instruction. So CCV will continue to provide their instruction remotely. NVU is planning to continue to provide a mixture of both in-person, online, and hybrid instruction, which they, they did in the fall quite successfully. Uh, Vermont Tech is going to continue with their approach from the fall, which was um, a low residency approach. Most of the instruction at Vermont Technical College was provided online, but they had intensive lab week classes. Um, so it had, they had a small number of students who resided on campus full time, and then they offered uh, residential uh, for the lab weeks. Um, and again, many of the students simply commuted, but there was an option uh, for students to reside periodically um, while they did their, their labs. Castleton was fully online in the fall um, and had some students residing on campus. They're going to be switching this spring um, more to the, the Northern Vermont University model of providing a combination of both in-person and online courses. With respect to testing, uh, the colleges again are, are following the, mandate, the mandatory guidance that's been issued by the administration. The most recent round of guidance was, the updated guidance came out in December um, and that provides for testing uh, day zero and day seven. Uh, one change for the spring compared to last fall is that now all students must quarantine. 
uh, previously students were not required to do so if they lived in Vermont or were coming from a, a safe county, but that's something that has now shifted uh, with the, the more recent uh, upsurge in, in cases. All three of our residential colleges are using Broad uh, for their testing. Uh, they have contracted for 17,400 tests for the spring semester. Uh, with only one exception in the fall, all the test results um, were provided within 24 hours by Broad. Uh, Vermont Tech also has a separate uh, contract to provide tests through another provider, uh, a smaller number of tests. Uh, weekly testing is available to campus-based community members at NVU. All three colleges will be doing monthly surveillance testing um, and athletes, um, those that are going to be competing, there's a, a more rigorous requirement for them and they're required to be tested three times a week. Uh, all students and, and those employees who are working on campus are required to complete daily symptom checks. Uh, as far as quarantine housing goes, again, the residential colleges all meet the requirements set forth in the mandatory guidance. Uh, residence halls have been set aside for quarantine and isolation. One of the unfortunate um, side effects of having a lower enrollment is that we do have plenty of space to manage quarantine and isolation as needed. Um, we've been able to provide uh, food and support to students that are in quarantine or isolation uh, working with our uh, Sodexo, who is our dining hall vendor, who have been a, a great partner for us in managing that. Um, uh, the cleaning is typically provided by um, our own staff, but when, when needed, uh, specialized cleaning um, is provided by outside contractors. You know, so for example, if we did have a student that was in isolation, we would contract um, to have specialized cleaning services provided for that. One of the other uh, questions with regard to the new uh, guidance that's come out is the definition of households. Uh, Northern Vermont University and Castleton have, have each designated residence halls as a household. And that means that students will not be allowed to socialize with students in other residence halls. And they will be following up and making sure that, um, you know, that's abided by. Uh, Vermont Technical College is still uh, deciding exactly how they're going to define a, um, what, what constitutes a household. Uh, all COVID mitigation strategies must be followed outside of a dorm room or personal office space. So that involves mask wearing, social distancing, um, et cetera. Um, employees um, have been encouraged to work remotely to the extent reasonably possible. Obviously we have some employees who, who are required to be physically present on campus, such as our public safety officers, um, you know, folks that work face to face with students, uh, but anyone that can uh, work remotely has been encouraged to do so and we've been um, providing the necessary support to those employees who are, who are working remotely. Uh, we provided um, the federal families um, first coronavirus relief at leave to our employees. Uh, we do have generous leave policies and we have allowed employees to run a negative leave balance um, as a way to avoid laying off or furloughing employees as a result of the pandemic. Obviously some of that could change if the virus uh, worsens or the state's rules change. If we get to a point where we had to be, for example, totally online, um, and maybe there would be some impact on our staff. But right now we've been successful in finding uh, work for employees and, and keeping them working through the, through the pandemic to date. So again, thank you so much um, to you and, and to all the legislators, but uh, for the encouragement and ongoing support that you've shown the Vermont State Colleges over the years. And we particularly want to thank you for the bridge funding that we did receive for the FY21 budget and the CRF funding we received, um, particularly the funding for the Workforce Initiative. Uh, we're very passionate about keeping students at the center of our work as we move forward. And um, the initiative that was provided for Workforce enabled us to um, you know, provide uh, upskilling, reskilling uh, programs to almost a thousand Vermonters at a time of great uncertainty and need. And that's something that um, we, we enjoyed doing and we're happy to be able to do. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy um, to answer any you may have. Terrific, thank you. Uh, very informative. Uh, again, we'll be jumping in next week even further uh, on our state colleges, but uh, for now, any, um, any immediate questions or comments, or questions in general? Uh, Cheryl, uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Chancellor, could you describe common ac accreditation for me? please. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so all of our institutions are accredited by the New England uh, Commission on Higher Education, also known as NECHI. Um, so a common accreditation would mean rather than the three institutions having to meet all the accreditation requirements, and there are standards that are set forth by NECHI, um, but instead of having to meet them all individually, we, they would meet them as a combined entity. So for example, you know, you have to have your own um, uh, chief financial officer, but instead of each institution having their own president, their own chief financial officer, they could have one for the for the combined entity. Um, and then there are other standards around, you know, academic standards, um, you know, financial standards, etc. Um, so it it would um, it would just mean that we could meet those accreditation standards combining the three institutions. Um, one of the other benefits is really quality of programs for students. So right now, you know, we have relatively, you know, we have small colleges spread out across the state. Um, so one of the benefits would be that we would be able to work more collaboratively across the individual institutions and then provide better, richer, um, stronger quality, you know, high quality programs to the students because they would have access to faculty at more than just their, their institution. Um, so there, is, there are some benefits. I, I do want to make clear, I mean, this is something that, um, you know, that, and you'll, you, you'll ask questions next week, I'm sure, uh, when you talk to folks um, about the select committee process. Um, it definitely would result in savings in the long run, but a common accreditation wouldn't result in immediate savings. Um, so for example, when we combine Johnson and Linden into Northern Vermont University, we have realized about $9 million worth of savings from that, that consolidation. Um, but the, the real benefit comes not so much from savings, but is what you can accomplish. Once, once you're one combined entity, uh, the administrative consolidations become a lot easier. It eliminates the competition uh, between the institutions. It enables you to come up um, you know, with a, a more effective way of delivering services at a lower cost to the students. Um, so I, I just wanna be, it, Common accreditation by itself is not a magic bullet, I think is what I'm trying to communicate to you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Chittenden. Chancellor Zidani, it's nice to sort of meet you. I believe I know your spouse and President Sullivan speaks very highly of you. So, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I work at UVM, I bleed green and gold, and I like to say, and something I offered at our opening education committee meeting that I, I just wanna hear your thoughts while we're here. Um, as I look to the Vermont State Colleges and the University of Vermont, I keep thinking of the same type of recommendations that we're seeing in this uh, uh, initial report from the select committee looking for the, what you were just speaking about, the savings and back office efficiencies through consolidation and coordination of services. And I, I keep thinking of other states and how the SUNY system or the UMass system or the UC system, I, I'm just wondering why, what are your thoughts? Um, and I have read the report, but, and I saw teasers about ways that UVM and VSC could work better together, but what are your general broad stroke thoughts about the notions of trying to incentivize and have the University of Vermont and Vermont State College not merge, uh, but, but incentivize them to find ways both in the back office to look for those same efficiencies you just spoke about so that we can extend our proven excellence in certain areas to each other, mutually support our higher education needs in the state while simultaneously building off the successes of CCB with the articulation agreements, looking for pathways and supporting pathways so that like you just said, less competition and more collaboration between the great institution of the University of Vermont and the great institutions of the Vermont State Colleges. Do you have any broad stroke thoughts or reactions? Is that a terribly naive notion for me to be, to be uh, constantly uh, raising in these discussions? So I think a couple of things. One, I think it's really important to understand there is a lot of collaboration that already happens um, informally. And I actually have reached out um, to our presidents to kind of ask them to give me the, the sort of list, the top sort of few things that they do. I know, for example, there's work that's going on um, between Vermont Technical College, their agricultural program and, and UVM. I mean, there's there's overlap there. So I, I know there is a number of ways in which we already you know work together on things. Um, I do know um, legislatively that a couple of, I'm probably, I may not have the exact times, but a couple of years ago, um, UVM and the Vermont State Colleges were asked to take a look at, at some of the back office pieces, for example, um, healthcare, 
um, you know, and things like that. And I, at the time it was determined that it would, it would actually be extremely costly and challenging to do it. Unfortunately, we, we have very different, um, you know, we have different healthcare. We use a different learning management system. We have a different, um, you know, people management, uh, you know, payroll system. So a lot of those things we have obviously in common within the Vermont State College system. So we can build on that internally. Um, but I think it would be a, a challenge to do some of those. I mean, it would be expensive and very disruptive in the short run to do that with UVM. Um, you know, in the long run, maybe it would, the long, long run, it might pay off. But I, that's my sense of where those um, explorations by the, legis by, by the legislature has gone in the past. Um, I certainly think there are openings. We right now, um, one of the things I mentioned was we're looking at doing um, a system-wide virtual library. And we have a very successful model that the Community College of Vermont and Vermont Technical College currently have. And we're looking at expanding that to Northern Vermont University and to Castleton University. But as part of that, the team that's looking at it has reached out to the library uh, folk at the University of Vermont to see if there's a way we can share subscriptions to databases, for example. So we definitely are open, um, and I believe President Garamella is as well, but we're definitely open to looking at ways where we can get some economies of scale on things like that. Um, you know, and certainly in the short term, those are things we can we can explore. I think the other, the bigger back office things would be a much bigger project and would require a lot more exploration. Chancellor, you're planning on, I'm sorry, Senator Chin, did you have a follow-up? No. So it sounds like uh, you are working toward uh, collaborating on things like admissions uh, or, or at least sharing resources. So are you envisioning, for example, possibly an admissions office that would represent each of the state colleges? Um, so that, under the... Yeah, under the select committee's recommendation, they're recommending that CCV remain separate and that these other three institutions have a common accreditation. So I, um, I think it would be, um, it, it would make sense for us to have a common, obviously a common admissions office, which could be, it doesn't have to be centralized. I want to make that clear as well. Everything doesn't have to all be in one place. Uh, as we've learned through COVID, we can be have centralized functions, but be dispersed geographically. Um, I don't think it would make sense to, to have the same admissions office for CCV, for example, because for some of the reasons that President Judy just referenced, I mean, they're on a different schedule. Um, their calendar isn't aligned. The, ca the academic calendar for the three residential colleges, we've now just recently this year, we're just moving to having one common academic calendar. But again, CCV is quite different. Um, they really have the three separate semesters. They register at different times. They have a different, you know, a very different model. I think the students, um, although there's significant overlap, um, the way they reach out to students is very different than a traditional, um, the traditional, more traditional four-year programs. You know, there you are recruiting for a four-year program. Again, we do have associate's degrees at VTC as well, but that's just a very different um, you know, a, a different model than recruiting semester by semester at, at a community sure. college. So I could certainly see having, you know, but again, there could be common, uh, there still could be benefits from, you know, being within a system of having alignment between the admissions of a combined entity and CCV, because I think one of the key things is we want to make sure people come in the right door. Um, and we do have students that maybe started a four-year college and aren't quite ready for it that maybe it would be better for them to start at CCV and then progress up to, uh, to coming to one of the four-year colleges. So I think having some alignment between uh, the admissions folk is important to make sure we do get people in into the system in the right place and find the right, the right program for them. Thanks. No, uh, the reason I raise admissions is it, it seems to me from, from where I'm sitting, admissions is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Uh, I, I may be wrong, but looking at what's happening around us, you know, I represent uh, Bennington County and I live in the town of Bennington. Just over the border is Hudson Valley Community College, uh, which Cuomo and others are moving in the direction of, you know, lowering and lowering tuition costs um, and where students can do everything now from study 
you know, English lit to becoming an undertaker. I mean, it, it's, and it, it's becoming more affordable. And then on the other side, you know, uh, you, you have spots like Southern New Hampshire, uh, I think it's Southern New Hampshire University, which also is keeping a lot of its students. And I mentioned Hudson Valley and Southern Vermont, Southern New Hampshire. It's because historically, as I understand it, at least in the Albany area and also parts of New Hampshire, we would get those students to, to a Castleton in particular from Albany and, and Lyndon and Johnson. And, and so I just see it as, as it is going to be a challenge. Admissions, especially as governors in other states can lower the tuition costs because they have you know, the, the dollars. And um, so I, I do see admissions. And I would also say philanthropy you know, is, is perhaps another area where there's, there's some kind of you know, merger, um, and not merger, but, but collaboration amongst all of you. But the admissions I think is perhaps from where I am uh, gonna be a great challenge. Also, I have to say, you know, you look at the independent colleges, we're gonna be hearing a little bit uh, from them tomorrow, but I know that they are trying to make certain that students don't leave with a lot of debt. Not all of them, but, you know, I, I know Bennington College well, you know, we try to make sure that students after four years uh, don't leave with much debt. Um, so there's, there's competition, I think, with, with the others as well. So I, it, to me, it just seems like one of the, the biggest challenges ahead. Right. I, I, so just to loop back on a couple of those things. So you're right. You're right. We're in a very, um, a very ruthlessly competitive market, and we're in the Northeast. So just as we have demographic challenges here in Vermont, we're not alone. The Northeast has them, um, and certainly, um, you know, Maine. Uh, Maine has been very aggressive in reaching out to other, uh, other surrounding states and saying we'll match your your in-state tuition. Um, again, those states other than New Hampshire um, generally are, are funded at a much higher rate than we've been historically, but mm -hmm. it does make us, um, you know, a challenge for us to compete with them. Um, I think on admissions, one of the, the benefits um, of moving towards a common accreditation and, and greater administrative um, consolidation is um, that we eliminate some of our internal competition. Because right now, you know, yes. you know, uh, you know, we're kind of competing against each other, and that right. doesn't really make any sense, right. um, particularly for students that can afford to pay more. To then be undercutting each other just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, on the philanthropy piece, um, you know, I think there's room to explore things there. I will say um, one of the challenges we have as a system is it's hard to raise money at the system level because people have no emotional attachment to the Vermont State College system. They went to or are affiliated with an individual institution. Sure. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of those, uh, you know, pieces. Um, and on the affordability issue, that's, that is really um, important to us. Um, we are very concerned about that. I mean, to me, the worst case of all, of, of all outcomes is to have somebody come incur debt and then leave with nothing. Um, so one of the things that we really have focused on, and, and again, you heard some of it from um, President Judy, but really having a number of off ramps so students can start and then they can get a certificate and then they can get an associate's degree and then a bachelor's degree, but they're building towards getting degrees. So they're not going to be leaving with nothing. If they're going, if they leave and they don't complete, they at least leave with something. And I think it was Senator Hooker that said, um, you know, about a lifetime of education, I, I do believe that um, we need to rethink higher education. It's not just traditional 18 to 22 year olds and, and four years, that people will be dipping in and out through their lifetime. And we need to be, be ready and prepared and able to, to meet that need. Um, so we're, we are really focused on that. Um, affordability is, is key. Um, we do believe, um, so although we have the demographic challenges in Vermont, uh, we definitely have an affordability issue in Vermont too, and that's um, something that is in the. Um, actually, it's it's. I don't know. It's not in detail in the initial report that you've probably seen from the select committee, but in the draft, the next version, um, they're proposing an affordability standard, um, and that's something uh, for the state to look at. Um, you know, the legislature to look at as we move forward. But we are very concerned about affordability. We did make the decision to freeze tuition uh, for this coming year. Um, so even though we're, we are facing a very challenging uh, financial 
picture, it just seemed really hard given everything that's been going on uh, with a lot of online instruction, et cetera, to be expecting students to, to, to face a you know, 3% tuition increase or something for, for next, for FY22. So we have frozen tuition across the board um, for FY22 coming up. Perfect. My final question, and then I'll pass it on to others, is along the, the good point that you made around competition, it seems as though uh, you do have majors, correct, that overlap. Like, for example, can you, can you study English at Castleton and Northern University? And in that way, I, I wonder if you're, if it makes kind of sense. And again, I'll, I'll leave it to, to those who know everything about the whole system and are looking at it more holistically. But I would just, you know, raise that also. Does it make sense to have duplication of, of majors? You know, can you come into this state and study history at uh, the same kind of history, if you will, a general history degree at two universities or like Castleton and Northern or, or, or are they very unique in that way in terms of uh, curriculum? So not, not the things you mentioned. So English and history, et cetera, are not um, particularly unique. I'll just quickly say education, for example, is. Mm -hmm. So we do have education programs at um, Northern Vermont University and at Castleton, and those are very sort of unique to each institution. Um, but um, as far as history and English and other programs go, we've actually been looking at that. We had an right. internal task force called the VSCS Forward Task Force that was created in the summer. They came up with four um, strong recommendations that went to our board and were adopted by our board. And one of them was to really focus on duplication of programs between Northern Vermont University and Castleton University in particular. Vermont Tech obviously has much more unique programming that's somewhat different. Um, and so um, there were a number of, uh, a, a committee was put together, the um, academic deans, faculty, um, to sort of think through those issues. Uh, we currently, with the, given the proposal from the select committee of now including Vermont Technical College as a possible combined entity, we've expanded that work to sort of think about uh, duplicate programs. And we currently are looking at um, working with a, we're, we're looking to hire, we have an RFP out, but work with an external consultant to really think through if we had a combined, emerged, you know, common accreditation for the three institutions, what programs should we be delivering and where should we be delivering them? So we are very focused on that. I will say in the short term, we have a number of faculty who have really stepped up in this area. And this semester we have, for example, math uh, faculty at Northern Vermont University and at Castleton that will be teaching students from the other institutions. So NVU math professors also teaching Castleton students and vice versa. Uh, the business faculty are doing the same thing. And I believe there's an archeology span um, course at Castleton that will be made available to students at, at, at NVU as well. So um, effectively the, you know, the, the faculty member will be in the classroom at NVU, but we'll have students you know, participating remotely, but being part of the class, but remotely from Castleton. So they're really, um, you know, we have a lot of faculty that have really you know, understood the message and are working together. And again, that really benefits students because some of the programs, you know, we only have uh, for political science, we have one political science faculty member at Northern Vermont University and one at Castleton. So, you know, you're not getting as rich an experience as if you have access to multiple faculty members, you know, in, in a particular subject area. So I think there are real benefits for our students um, to, you know, to have access to faculty and programs at other institutions. Other questions? Uh, yes, Senator Chin. So there again, I'm just going to be a barking dog on this to what you just said, Chancellor Zadatny. It seems to me that I'd love to foster ways to have UVM open up some of its availability of seats to uh, VSC students so that the VSC doesn't need to stand up a Russian program or a German program or a geology program, if that's what we're talking about. Uh, and that way they could take those courses um, in, through articulation agreements, trusted curriculum, and so on. We used to have these Z sections set. I work at the University of Vermont, so I, I offer this as a part of our continuing ed 
program would have reserved seats for each courses. I'd love to see a world where the University of Vermont working with the Vermont State Colleges has that, especially with all of the technologies that have been thrust upon us over the last year in this pandemic, to find ways that BSC students can access the same uh, curr the curriculum that they're qualified to take in similar fashions that we see um, successful in, in other states, like our neighbors, the SUNY system and so on. I'm just gonna keep talking about how BSC and UVM can work together for as long as the voters put me in here. So I hope I'm, I'm not annoying you with this, this line of thought. Other questions? Yes, Senator Lines. I was just gonna say thank you. And uh, Senator Chitten, Chittenden has uh, expressed my feelings as well. So I don't have to ask a question. And in particular, the geology program is a significant loss because we don't really have the state geologists and we, we need some groundwater mapping and, and other things that are so critical. Oh, what a shame. Anyway, um, thank you for your work. And it's a pleasure to have you here and to meet you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Senator Hooker. Um, just a quick question on enrollment um, for the spring when the kids come back in February what's that gonna look like as far as percentage of the student body that left? You know, how many of them are actually coming back to campus? I don't actually have that information right now. We can certainly get it to you. Um, we have a board meeting coming up on Friday and the presidents will be sharing information about what they're seeing for enrollment on Friday. So I, I know it's coming. I just don't, I don't have it to give to you right now, I'm afraid, but we, we can get that to you. Thank you. And I, I would just follow up on uh, Senator Chittenden's um, point too, is that, and I, again, to build off on what President um, Joyce Judy was saying, um, a lot of students are, 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 are well served by online if it's well done. Um, and I think we can tell that particularly through CCV because they went exclusively online. And some of those students are ones that maybe, you know, you would think would face the greatest challenges with doing courses online. Um, so I think offering a, a, an, a, a range of things and having options. I mean, we do know that we have students that are, are much better served in person. Um, so I do think looking forward, it will be that combination of having online options available for flexibility and, and uh, whatever, but also having the in-person, um, you know, I, I think that's, that will be, you know, what the future will look like for, for higher everywhere. I mean, not just for us, but everywhere. Anything else? Well, thank you. Lively, uh, terrific conversation. Chancellor, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, please know you're, you're always welcome uh, to be here whenever you, you'd like to be. And, uh, and of course, next week, as you know, as we hear this report, it might be something that you might want to be a part of. And just please know if you have a, an open invitation. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here with us and great to see Catherine again as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just to let you know, I mean, we are, again, we are working, our board is, is reviewing the select committee's recommendations and has asked us to really explore what would that look like? What, you know, how long could it take and, and things like that. So we, uh, we have not made any final decisions because it's too early to do that, but we are fully vetting uh, what's being proposed by the select committee. So. And if you would uh, maybe through Catherine can just keep us updated a, a bit and then we can have you back at an appropriate time as well just to hear your thinking on things as you vet it. More than happy to do that. Thank you Great. very much. Thank you. So uh, committee, um, that is uh, it for the day. Uh, we have a uh, Busy days uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, until about the same time tomorrow as well as Friday. And working on next week's uh, schedule as well, pretty much again, trying to get introductions out there, get updates um, on COVID and uh, what's happening on the ground, as well as going through all of your priorities uh, and the questions that you put forward yesterday when we had that round table things that you're interested in knowing and topics that you're interested in hearing um, from people on. Any final questions or comments before we all see each other uh, tomorrow? And we'll uh, leave it there. Thanks everybody. Great, great day. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you.